Buenos días, bienvenidos al quinto. Good morning and welcome to the fifth uh, annual uh, seminar on uh, forest monitoring, a space that will allow us for three days to give voice to different national and international actors that participate in monitoring, registering, and behavior of uh, forest. In esta, la primera jornada, hablaremos de la During this first day, we'll talk about the importance of monitoring forest and on the um, monitoring system of forest and carbon in Colombia. We have been able to uh, uh, follow on the behavior of forest, specifically on the course of deforestation. Thanks to this monitoring, it's possible to have early warnings of deforestation issued by 
IDEAMA, which allows to decision makers to uh, have precise strategies in order to open this day. We will give the floor to Francisco Jose Cruz, Vice Minister of Environmental Policy and Normalization from the Ministry of Environment. Good morning, Mr. Vice Minister. You have the floor. Good morning, Angie. Uh, special greetings uh, from the beautiful city of Villa Vicenza in the Department of Meta. Greetings to Yolanda Gonzalez, uh, director of the uh, IDEAM. Uh, and, and to uh, good morning to the different speakers, guests, uh, and participants to this event. It's an honor for me to um welcome you to this fifth uh, annual seminar on uh, uh, the monitoring of forest coverage in colombia this kind of e academic events uh, uh, makes us join in event uh, being convinced that uh, uh, visibility uh, across uh, academia and institution is important and has to be shared in events and spaces like the one we are uh, seeing today. The president, uh, Ivan Duque, wants the decision to be based on science. Uh, knowledge of our forest uh, becomes therefore a strategic element for decision-making mechanism on these natural resources. Along this line, our Ministry of uh, Environment, together with EDM, has been generating timing, uh, reliable and consistent information that allows us to uh, show to the country important results, uh, such as the one I will list now, the progress made in terms of 48% uh, of the baseline of the forest inventory of the country, a task that has been done jointly with the uh, research institute and that has progressed uh, gradually despite the uh, uh, pandemics. Secondly, the inventory will allow us to know, among others, the, the flower, uh, flora composition, uh, forest uh, biological diversity, uh, the role of forest in uh, different uh, areas, and basic information for planning and sustainable use of forest resources. We rely on the forest and carbon monitoring system uh, that has been in operation since 10 years uh, now. Uh, I've been following closely the results of this monitoring system and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, operated by excellent professionals. This system has informed us on a timing and constant basis on the behavior of for deforestation in the country, one of the more complex problems we face. Luckily, last Sunday, the Congress of the Republic, thank also to the coordinated effort of the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Defense, has been able the, uh, to uh, approve uh, the crime of uh, deforestation as a new category of crime in the uh, criminal code to punish those who are uh, destroying our forest. Also, the system, the monitoring system, gives us information that has allowed us to um, make a decision make decision on strategic uh, ways to protect the natural wealth of our uh, country. This system, I was saying, has contributed to 
uh, execute several uh, uh, actions in the Leticia agreement. Uh, uh, the IDEAM uh, uh, considers that the carbon reserve stored in different parts of the natural uh, forest uh, and land emission and uh, greenhouse gases. This is how Colombia monitors and reports on the commitment of the country in these uh, areas. The uh, monitoring in the area of forest uh, uh, is quite accurate. Uh, we are talking about uh, an accuracy level uh, of approximately 90%. This is uh, um, over 10% of uh, platform accuracy. This allows that this level of accuracy, uh, Colombia will be a pioneer in monitoring the forest and uh, also uh, a ongoing monitoring uh, has been uh, taken place during the last seven, eight years. And this uh, uh, kind of monitoring allows us to be able to comply with the zero deforestation goal for 2030. The algorithms uh, used by IDEAM uh, to measure the monitor monitoring uh, have been developed by Colombian professors, professionals uh, and has uh, um, uh, evaluated uh, many times the system. This um, also uh, the country is able to uh, uh, make uh, strategic and assertive uh, and accurate decision. So thanks to this monitoring system so that the deforestation can end always uh, under the guidelines of our presidents uh, through the National Council of uh, Fight Against Deforestation and other uh, criminal, uh, other uh, forest crimes. We work with the Ministry of Justice, with the Attorney General Office, uh, 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 to uh, uh, fight against deforestation in a coordinated way. And we are achieving them. Thanks to the campaign called Artemisa, we are controlling deforestation and uh, also uh, pursuing the uh, people who are responsible, criminally responsible for deforestation that in different parts of Colombia, of Colombia like uh, the uh, uh, Chocoan, uh, Darien, and also in the Catatumbo in another region are uh, uh, undertaking illegal mining, which is one of the main activity responsible for deforestation. Uh, we, in order to, uh, in order to comply with the 2030 zero deforestation goals, uh, EDM is also involved in uh, um, forestation activities uh, with uh, more than 61 million trees uh, planted, 60, 61 million trees planted across uh, the Colombian territory during the uh, uh, President Duque, uh, President Duque uh, presidency. For example, here in Villa Vicencio, where, where I am, uh, 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 local institutions have uh, contributed with 48% of the planting of this 61 million trees. This is why we also thank uh, the governors of the different regions, uh, the private sectors, uh, the mayors and the NGOs that have uh, played uh, a leading role. Uh, and so we together uh, reach the final goal of 180 uh, new trees planted in Colombia during the presidency of uh, uh, Mr. Duque. We'd like also to thank our strategic uh, partners for the monitoring of our forests. I want to highlight uh, the government of uh, Norway, UK, Germany, US, and all the EU 
among uh, our uh, main uh, partners. I do not want to uh, leave before saying that I want you to I want to encourage you to support this initiative that uh, um, our countries follows in a committed way. Uh, <clears throat> These uh, three days of seminar will allow us to exchange ideas, uh, thoughts, experiences, uh, talking about science among countries like uh, Norway, uh, Peru, uh, Ecuador, so that we can uh, strengthen our uh, ties. And finally, uh, Yolanda, uh, Yolanda, thank you for the work you undertake as the leader of the IDEAM Institute for our great country. Special greetings to you. Thank you to Angie, and we will continue following your, this seminar. Thank you all. Vice Minister, thank you very much. And uh, uh, we now officially open this uh, seminar on hashtag for the, the hashtag for the event is hashtag Seminario Monteoreo Forestal. You can share your opinion, your comments, your questions. And before we continue, uh, let's look at the uh, um, video about the current situation on forest in Colombia. Todas las mañanas para entregarles la información más reciente del pronóstico del tiempo. Una mañana seca promete el Caribe colombiano, aunque en luz de... This video is about uh, the uh, weather forecast, uh, highlighting different uh, region of Colombia, like the archipelagos of San Andres and Providencia. Also, the Pacific area of the countries with dry weather, with uh, showers in the southern part uh, of in Cundinamarca, forecast is uh, showers in different areas of this region. Clouds over the Orinoquia region uh, and possible showers in Arauca in the western part of Casanare. And during the first hours of the day, showers in the eastern part. In the capital, uh, uh, dry weather. And then let's talk about uh, uh, warnings. Uh, one in the Guavio River, also in Bolivar, high level of the Magdalena River in Guajira. Uh, there are probabilities of fires, uh, red warning in different areas of the country shown on the map. And uh, then we have different level of warnings, red in the previous slide and orange in this one. This is a video by IDEAM. Now that we know the weather forecast, uh, I'd like to invite the first woman that is now heading uh, the uh, uh, Institute of IDEAM, Yolanda, forest engineer specialized on graphic information and meteorology sciences. Uh, director, uh, good morning and welcome to our seminar. Uh, good morning, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, according to wherever you are across the globe, uh, whether in Colombia or in other countries. Um, Mr. Minister of Environment, uh, Mr. Carlos Correa, Francisco Cruz, Vice Minister of uh, Policies and Environmental Normalization, um, panel uh, panelist, participant, uh, and uh, 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 different uh, territorial organization. And to all the EDM team that uh, are organized this meeting, 
the team of communication and all the different teams and people that are supporting today in doing the three days of the event thank you very much is the is an honor for me to uh, uh, invite you to the fifth national yearly seminar on uh, uh, forest uh, coverage and monitoring in colombia a uh, special greeting uh, to the community organization, uh, the Black communities of River Tolo and the coast of Cocomasu, to the representative Everley Cordova Borja of this or community organization, to the representative Hermes Carreños, uh, community leader Johnny Arnolandino, legal representative of the community foundation that protects the environment in the Serrania of San Lucas and Guamoco. Mr. Guillermo Rosales Domingo from the association uh, 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 called Agro Solidario Charalas. Mr. Galeano, legal representative of Eco Serrania organization, El Tamar. Mr. Samar Cesar de Flores, Governor Patino, Indigenous Guard from the Indigenous Reservation in San Antonio de Calarma. And other organiza community organizations with which we work, like the South Makiramo Corporation, also Piedemonte Andino Masonico Cordespa, a community organization that are part of the environmental program for peace and reconciliation, community organization that are part of the program Amazon all together. To all of you that are the essence of, not only of this seminar, but of the forest work in Colombia, we will be jointly analyzing the forest of Colombia during the next three days with scientific, academic and community exchange, um, talking about different strategies that are being developed to monitor forest resources in Colombia. Uh, monitoring the system of, of uh, forest and carbon, uh, national inventory and different processes of forest conservation. We have also uh, called on uh, different uh, international organizations to exchange their experiences on this aspect and have clear perspective on how we're working in favor of forest in Colombia and in the region. During this, uh, uh, this day, we also want to highlight the 10 years of the monitoring system, uh, this, given that this is the official tool to generate uh, uh, monitoring data on forest coverage, the characterization of the causes uh, and agent of deforestation, emission of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, uh, these are some of the tasks uh, developed by this system, uh, uh, a system that is a reason of pride for us. Uh, we have been able to develop uh, the different uh, technology that have allowed uh, more timing information and we are proud to be pioneer in terms of uh, more accurate scale this has allowed us to make better uh, decision uh, decision making based on uh, science and data we thank for the acknowledgement of the vice minister to all the monitoring system and to ideam in this work done by and for Colombians. Also, we have Colombian scientists who are leader in the world and the monitoring system of deforestation and carbon uh, uh, is a valuable asset for Colombia. The different environmental authorities uh, have been received uh, our knowledge so that uh, we can facilitate the interinstitutional work and there are examples of institution with which we share our knowledge based on the uh, monitoring system this interinstitutional intercommunity relationship becomes even more important in analyzing and uh, identifying the uh, reasons and uh, sources of the deforestation. We will 
improve with you, with the communities, with the leaders, with the academia that allow us to uh, improve. Uh, we also, there are processes of uh, certifications. There is a natural information uh, of uh, uh, forest, and we are already certified, and we are in the process of being recertified because it's our responsibility uh, to gather information that uh, provides the figures. We also need to assess ourselves and. Uh, uh, I want to highlight uh, the work of a strategic partner, which are the organization with uh, whom we monitor the forest. With them, we have been able to uh, uh, learn things like local governance, the respect for the territory, the use of a clear language, the sustainable use of forest, uh, secondary product uh, use, uh, cartography, and use of images. We have also developed what we call the school of uh, knowledge and the school of the uh, forest, uh, tropical forest, uh, even during the, the pandemic with uh, uh, scientific uh, exchange. I thank you all. Uh, uh, for uh, all this time that where we have trained ourselves mutually looking for the uh, uh, common goal uh, which is the preservation of the forest where the you where you live you the communities uh, tell us how to protect your forest and we as idiam tell you how to monitor the uh, development of your forest we are uh, developing the uh, uh, baseline, and I do not want to uh, dwell too much on this item because we will cover it during the next few days. But I do want to highlight the progress made by the uh, different units of our institution in terms of uh, knowledge and methodological documentation of the inventory we analyze ourselves we update and we are always in this uh, up, always in this uh, process of ongoing update i know that the director of the institution of research of colombia and other countries are listening to us and i want to highlight uh, the uh, work of the uh, science research institute that uh, together with them uh, uh, have enabled us uh, to uh, um, to continue providing the information that is so necessary the technical engineers who are in the field generating uh, uh, the knowledge we would like to thank also the university especially the national university of medellin of tolima francisco jose de caldas uh, and other, and other uh, to UIS, the University of Chocó, the Amazon uh, University, the Herb University of uh, Amazon, Unigiano, and to all the uh, uh, scientific uh, academic institutions that have helped us uh, in the development of the inventory. Uh, we will soon uh, uh, launch the national uh, uh, forest inventory and uh, we also have been able of uh, we have been able to measure uh, 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 indicators across the country all this information you will find in the web page in the website of the IDEAM we will continue uh, sharing this information and we've been able to uh, link uh, several professionals. Uh, we have been able to contribute to the economic uh, uh, um, progress uh, at local level. So all this, uh, so it is very important for us to generate this kind of opportunity in difficult moment like this. It's important for the country and for us. 
And the challenge is that all of us, the community um, and the professionals, ourselves, the local government, uh, will able to continue both the uh, national inventory as well as uh, other processes. Uh, this has been able, thanks to the relationship with the community, and having the community as great allies in the knowledge of natural resources. It's important that we're talking about 200 community organizations that progress in uh, with participative monitoring activities. This is why we, are, we have focused on you, the communities in this uh, opening uh, remarks, uh, the uh, hundreds of organizations that work. It's important to thank the min Minister Correa, all his technical team uh, for the strengthening of the coordination among uh, central and local organization that can be seen in the territory in making decision, in delivering transparent information to all your team, Mr. Minister, with which we work on an ongoing basis. Thank you very much. And finally, I would like to thank our strategic allies and donor government that are with us today, that on an ongoing basis have supported the EDM in the important work of monitoring for, for us. We thank them. We thank you for your trust from the very first day of the creation of the forest monitoring system. And uh, thank you for uh, supporting us and for the interest shown by you in supporting the different initiatives that we lead. You've always been attentive to our needs. And then I want to highlight the support of Norway, UK, Germany, US, the European Union, among other governments that have allowed us to uh, uh, work with this important responsibility we have. I think that the, I hope that these three days will be very fruitful for each one of you. And, uh, and, uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, we will be able to share forest uh, uh, related uh, information. I wish everyone a successful day and I hope that we will be able to con to work together based on science to contribute to one of the most important strategic assets of the country, our forest, our home, our life and uh, for all everyone who uh, lives here, not only the community that live in the forest, but also all the country. Uh, more than 50% of the country is covered by forests, so we encourage you to continue planting trees, planting life and protecting our forests. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your welcoming remarks, Director. Without further ado, we will now begin our panels. But before yielding to our next panelist, I would like to ask that we look at this video on the Colombian Amazon region and the impact of deforestation in that region specifically. Deforestation is one of the biggest causes for biodiversity loss in the Amazon region in Colombia and also for the loss of water capacity. The causes for deforestation are extensive cattle ranching, illegal cropping, illegal felling and mining, misuse of lands illegally, roads infrastructure that have, uh, has not been authorized, and so the national government, through the Ministry of the Environment, has created a vision for the Amazon region with the support of its international donors. With this, the government seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as a result of deforestation through a sustainable model for the use of natural resources. We invite you all to be part of the change and to help us protect the Amazon region. 
we have the support of Norway, the UK, Germany, and we thank you. Very well. As we've seen in this video, deforestation is one of the large challenges confronted around the world in fighting climate change. And Colombia is indeed one of the key countries to attain the greenhouse gas emission reduction that has been set for 2030. That is how the national government and the private sector have joined efforts to bring down the loss of forests in the country. And a clear example is Vision Amazonia, an initiative through the Ministry of the Environment, which, with the support of the Kingdom of Norway, the UK, Northern Ireland, and Germany through KFW, seeks to bring down greenhouse gas emissions as a result of deforestation in the Amazon region in Colombia. The idea is to implement a sustainable development model, uh, model under a PPR or payment per results model to drive the strategies to protect forests and natural resources, and in the same fashion to empower local communities and indigenous communities by promoting practices that are, that are low in deforestation. And with this, I would like to yield to Jose Junior Nevera. He is a lawyer. He has a master's degree in public administration from the Andes University and the JFK um, School in Harvard. He is director of the Amazonia program, and he will talk to us about deforestation in that region in Colombia. Welcome, Dr. Barak. This is Jose speaking. Good morning, everyone. I will be speaking in Spanish. I want to greet you all. I want to thank you for this opportunity. I will save on the greeting a bit, um, since both the Vice Minister and Yolanda have done a wonderful job at uh, introducing all those who are with us this morning. So I will delve right into the matter. And for this, I will be presenting two different projects that uh, Vision Amazonia is extremely proud of as they are examples of a strategy to, to control and contain deforestation in the region. So first, I will also be showing a video and then an analysis. So in this video, what we're seeing is how uh, vast the territory is in the Amazon and also how we need to combat deforestation, a horrible scourge, as the vice minister has called it. These are some of the patches that the monitoring system is uh, overviewing and monitoring. And we have their very strong support so that Colombia can have solid data and solid information to implement its uh, containment strategies. So this was taken, this is an air view. This was taken in February last year. As you can see in the Amazon, we are overviewing about uh, 41 million, 45 million hectares of the biomass. Angie, just uh, uh, if you can please uh, confirm that you're viewing the presentation, is that correct? Angie speaking, yes, we are, we see the map. So indeed, the video we saw a moment ago is right in the, with, within the red circle and the Camuya region. These are the two big circles. This is the area we've analyzed in 2019 and 2020. In order to be able to come with better proposals and solutions to mitigate these patches. Now, of course, this is not the result of my work only. This is the result of the work of the people of the team in the monitor monitoring system, Ederson, Gustavo Galindo, whom I uh, thank extensively for the work that they have been carrying out for the last 10 
and more years. We've also introduced some analysis uh, on intervals to understand the uh, patches. This is thanks to the work with Alvaro Jaramillo as well as Cristian Forero. And I also want to mention Johan Ramirez and Ferney Gutierrez from Cor Macarona, Cor Corpo Amazonia, and IDEA. This is a historical trend of de deforestation. In the lower line, we see what the deforestation means in the Amazon biomass. These are the percentages of deforestation between 2001 to 2019 with a national average of 144,000 hectares per year. Historical deforestation in the Amazon has been 1,636,000 hectares with on average 86,000 um, hectares across all the governments for the presidents that we're seeing on screen. We see a very high level uh, right before uh, the peace accord was uh, signed. Now, if we look at the Amazon, the carbon and forest monitoring system in 2018, we see a high percentage and then how it started to decrease and how the Amazon region contributes uh, to uh, total deforestation in the country at a 62% rate. At the time, what we said was, okay, so we have the overarching definition of deforestation. We, this is what we see in red. That's where most deforestation is concentrated in, in Colombia. But why not, we thought to ourselves, analyze. Uh, and that's how we focused to, uh, on analyzing between 2019 and 2020 over the last three years um, of the year and the first three years of each year. According to the dry season, um, that's when um, the uh, because of the dry season, it's easier to fell and burn these uh, territories. And uh, then uh, we decided to produce this uh, chart that we're seeing to analyze deforestation levels, where we thought we need to break down, we need to take apart deforestation and understand it on a piece-by-piece -piece basis, if you will. That's how we identified 28 different nuclei during those six months during, in the last part of 2019 and the first part of 2020. Now, even though uh, this uh, chart shows 28 nuclei, I'm going to focus on three for this uh, presentation, where we look at polygons or intervals, deforestation 0 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 50, and greater than 50 hectares. And we um, looked at each one of those areas. Are they behaving the same? Where should we prioritize our efforts? So we look at the Mapiripan River, where we had around 8,000 before uh, felled. Uh, hectares uh, with a greater number during the last part of 2019 and then about 2,000 or 3,000 during the first part of 2020 with 199 different polygons or, or uh, specific ranches, if you will. So that's how we classified them between 0 and 10 hectares. Of the 199 patches, 73 were under 20, under 10 hectares, 56 were uh, somewhere between 10 and 30 hectares. 28 patches were between 30 um, and 50, and the rest uh, were at 50, or greater than 50. So that's how we classified the polygons of deforestation. Of the 73, between 0 and 20, the entire deforestation in the Mapiripan nucleus made up 286 hectares altogether. So the problem was not in the smaller polygons, if you will. Now, for the second range, we had 56 patches that made up more than 1,000 hectares. But again, we're looking at 8,000 hectares altogether. So 1,000 is not the large portion of 8,000, the largest portion. Now, we're looking at uh, the patches between 30 and 50, and then what a surprise, greatest deforestation was in uh, the patches uh, greater than 50 hectares in size. 
So if you look at the different polygons, they, the 0 to 10 range make only uh, 0.5% of the entire hectares uh, subject to deforestation. Altogether, Mapiripan contributes to the region the greatest part of deforestation with 68%. And we looked at the median deforestation, 0 to 10, is 3.92 hectares. Between 10 and 30, we had 18.37 hectares. And then between 30 and 50 hectares, about 40.5 40, uh, 40 median. And the bulk of the deforestation in the larger portions of land or patches. So that's where we have the biggest problem. So perhaps here we thought we need to look at something uh, beyond uh, payment for, for services, but um, at appropriations or some other solution. And then to the right, we see a greater analysis that I will not delve into. But what we can conclude is that for Mapiripan, of the more than 8,000 uh, hectares subject to deforestation, a large portion of it is concentrated in the largest por uh, patches of land. Now here, graphically, in another area, during the same amount of time, in the same uh, period of time between 2019 and 2020, we had 4,095 hectares, making up 6.07% of total deforestation for the region. However, we see that of the more than 4,000 hectares, 400 and some, um, these are all divided in 400 and some uh, polygons. So we're going from more than 8,000. We have almost twice as many as polygons. And we see that the greatest concentration in Uribia is in the smaller patches of land. So we're looking at a more campesino uh, structure, if you will, configuration, if you will. So re remember, Mamiripan, we see greatest concentration in larger portions of land, whereas in Uribia, we see the largest concentration in the smaller portions of land. And we did, uh, we ran this analysis for each one of the areas in the Amazon. And that's how we can get a clear guidance on what policies should be followed. After running this analysis, and to put it in, in simple terms, if you will, over those 10 months, we had 4,091 polygons as a snapshot, if you will, of what was happening in the Amazon region. And the concentration for polygons were at about, uh, the smaller polygons were about 60%, but they uh, represented only almost 19% of total deforestation, whereas the larger polygons, those that are, are more than 50 hectares in size, they had altogether 4.8% of all the polygons and yet represented 30.3% of total deforestation. So the big uh, uh, collectors of deforestation, if you will, are the, are the are the larger portions of land. And that informs policy analysis. If I'm going to carry out any inter inter intervention, how can I be more efficient and more effective with those interventions? Where should I be focusing my efforts? And that's how, with the distribution, we started to build these maps. In other words, not think of deforestation as a uniform um, event, but rather as a, as a specific event, depending on, on the circumstances. So that's how in Mapiripan we had the 7%. And altogether, what we're seeing here is how you and we should all together focus our efforts. So how is this represented in maps? Now, when we talk about Mapiripan, over here, we say to the government, look, 
there are people who are hoarding certain territories between these two rivers. And we've run this uh, patch analysis, and perhaps here we need to run greater surveillance instead of a payment per services setup. The system is so precise to date that it tells you where and, uh, and, and when the deforestation is happening. And that's how you can take measures for control and surveillance and bring in the different control entities. We talked about Uribe Meta, where I'm pointing here in the red circle, which uh, had a very different behavior than uh, the first chunk that we looked at. Again, this is a desk analysis, if you will. And further analyses are required, whereby we need to define what institutional support we may have in different deforestation areas. This is a very far removed area. Access is quite difficult. These are some areas that oftentimes are 30, 40 kilometers away from a minimum urban nuclear, nucleus. So maybe there we would need to include some system related to payment for environmental services. But again, all this data provides a great deal of information that requires further analysis in order to focus our efforts. Now, a second area um, where we see the number two, here what we see is deforestation as a result of uh, speculation in soil use. That's how I'm going to concentrate only on this block that I'm um, pointing at here. And for this, we included smaller intervals to understand a different a, a mix of problems where there are big hoarders, but also small uh, scale activities that uh, produce deforestation. And this uh, will help us analyze what's going to happen in the, in, in the coming months and periods. Now, if we look at Caramar, when I'm, where I'm pointing on the map, we're looking at what uh, actions we could implement. Maybe payment for environmental services. We're looking at areas that are 30 kilometers from an urban area where there may be a police station, a mayor, a municipal director, and quote unquote, we could have some sort of surveillance and control. Now, this analysis was done for the Amazon, and then we thought, well, maybe this could be applied across the country. And we said, okay, that's possible, but then we would need to include additional intervals. So we inserted four different intervals. So we looked at the Amazon, and uh, based on what we did in the Amazon, we also looked at where it'd be, where it'd be more cost-effective um, to intervene across the country with a 2014 to 2019 analysis. And I'm gonna show you some of the most uh, prominent results. We analyzed some areas under two hectares or between, then between two and five, then five to 10, then five to 20, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50, and greater than 50. I'm gonna show you again the progression. As we increase in hectares, we see concentrations increasing in the Amazon region in the lower uh, in the middle right part of, of the map, which is the Amazon. So this uh, we divided and split up uh, in uh, political terms uh, so that each department uh, knows where their efforts needs and need to be concentrated and that we may have a measurement of uh, deforestation levels on a per department level. So for example, Norte de Santander makes up 5% of uh, deforestation nationwide. If you look at Antioquia, they make up almost 13% of uh, deforestation nationwide. So we're looking at this from uh, on a per department basis and, and nuclei basis. And this brings us back to the Department of Meta in the Amazon region, which may allow the government to understand where it could better focus its efforts. 
um, maybe countries or pardon, departments that uh, have more uh, financial means like Antioquia um, can tackle things differently and specifically and not uh, depend only on national government efforts, for example. And in looking at this data and in analyzing this information, we started to understand where certain strategies would be, would be more cost effective. And it's no surprise that in many of the departments pointed out 80.9% of the forestation in those departments uh, happen in certain specific nuclei where efforts need to be consecrated. And this is a, also a, a breakdown of what municipalities we could focus on. A small number of municipalities concentrate deforestation between 2014 and 2019. 15 of those um, make up more than 50% of deforestation nationwide. And we have additional data according to patch sizes, somewhere between under two hectares, two to five hectares, and so on and so forth. And for the rural areas, what we call veredas in Spanish, we analyzed uh, almost 1,500 veredas and realized that in 33 of those rural areas, um, they were concentrated to almost 25% of deforestation nationwide. So those are also areas that yeah, can be targeted specifically. So this is an analysis uh, on a per year basis, not just in veredas. For example, Ciudad Yare is the vereda with the greatest deforestation in the period with 3% of national deforestation. So we started to look at it and understand different hectare sizes um, or size of polygons, total number of hectares, and try to understand the different dynamics. Um, something that may have to do with uh, land accumulation and other factors that may inform policy. I'm about to wrap up, but one thing I'd like to share is that 33%, almost 34% of deforestation happens in polygons that are greater than 50 hectares in size. Of the 1,018, 1 million and 18,000 hectares that were uh, subject to deforestation in those years, almost 34% were for polygons greater than 50 hectares in size. And then we can look at each one of the hectare size uh, ranges. Now regarding forecast, context, and planning. This, of course, is a snapshot of the lower Caguan and Caquetá rivers, and it's easy to predict that this area will be the next that will be subject to uh, great deforestation levels in the Amazon. And um, we therefore are moved to implement more actions in this area for, air, for mitigation and prevention. This is the active nucleus of deforestation in Putumayo. I'm just going to direct your attention to this part of the map that has to do with illegal cropping in Uriba. Now, the issue here is not with great extensions of land. If you see, there's only about one or two air patches that are greater than 50 hectares in size. Um, and it's also important to always keep in mind how far some of these polygons are from any urban area. The context here is, is different. Um, here, uh, there's a lot of uh, coca leaf cropping and planting. And this is uh, data that has provided by Sinchi, but again, this is just to provide context. Uh, on, as regards in what different uh, situations there can be deforestation. This is yet another deforestation nucleus that is being analyzed. So the system allows us to work in a much more effective fashion when it comes to decision making. Now, if this is the 
deforestation are. This is how we're working already with different forest uh, use planning. And these are some of the areas that we need to analyze further to see if the nation, the department, or the municipality um, need to work independently or all together to tackle the issue as identified in the region. So we need, with this, what we're building is a portfolio of territories and areas that need to be worked on and to have a previous analysis of each one of these areas to understand what actions need to be taken to effectively bring down deforestation levels in those areas that are not part of indigenous or natural reservations. I think that as a final remarks and conclusions, uh, since deforestation is an ongoing uh, process that requires um, information both in the short, the mid and the long runs, um, we need those snapshots of uh, the last 10 months, for example, and even longer, but we also need to understand where the dynamics are going, where the situation is going. And this may allow us to define a better strategy that can be better managed and better targeted, and so that our interventions and our initiatives can be more rational and more effective and efficient. And in the same fashion, investments. So for example, when understanding a context, when running forecasts for a specific context, when def defining actions, we can understand um, what actions would be best, and which would allow for better surveillance, and which areas would respond better to payment for environment, environmental services. Um, as the system, as the director has said, is very robust and it ha is, has been internationally recognized. We're very proud of the of the analysis that we have been running. And the next step is continue to develop this analysis set up. As the Vice Minister said, technical experts at EDM have achieved enormous technical achievements in that regard. But we need uh, to implement machine learning and automatic learning so that we can um, tap into analytics and do this much faster. And for this, we need to work also with the autonomous uh, corporations regionally. For this reason, it's very important to communicate and um, share the information so that the entire country can, on a targeted basis, participate in the fight against deforestation and understand whether the department needs to be tied in to the effort or the municipality or the local community action boards. I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you. I want to thank the team. I am simply someone who is presenting the data, but behind this data, there's uh, there's there's a great team of people and the EDAM's monitoring system. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Jose. We have several questions in the chat box. Uh, we will try to uh, answer as many as many possible because of uh, time limits. But I want to also uh, uh, tell you that presentations uh, will be shared uh, to the uh, with you to uh, sending them to the e email uh, if you uh, have registered uh, you can also share your comments on the hashtag Seminario Monitorio Forestal. The first question I want to ask you, Mebarak, is this. At the beginning, you talked about uh, the, uh, the uh, areas you have identified in the Amazon. So the, the question is, uh, what? Uh, how do you control these uh, land? In other words, uh, uh, are there sanctions against people who are identified as those who are responsible for deforestation? And how this will be uh, aligned in, with the law and legislation being approved uh, in, uh, by uh, the Congress? As I said, fighting against deforestation yes. is very complex. It's not just uh, control and surveillance, it's economic alternatives, policy initiatives, a number of things have to be taken into account. 
uh, the person who is uh, um, asking the question uh, is um, that is suggesting that there are sanctions and yes this is way a way of one strategy but in other parts uh, uh, the uh, only solution is uh, through the attorney general office instead in other areas where there are uh, uh, the community are involved uh, uh, maybe a, a different policy and strategy has to be applied and uh, and, and 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 so the monitoring system uh, is part of the main structure for controlling deforestation then each alternative has been has to be tailored to the uh, local community and local situation now with respect to the law that is being reviewed by the presidency bueno, uh, uh, how can that be uh, aligned uh, well of course uh, that law is very uh, in a very important message well uh, now uh, now deforestation is legally a crime so so people that so that gives a deterring signal uh, but this is only one part of the strategy yes of course the fact that you are liable for deforestation and can go to jail obviously is an important step but control and surveillance uh, is a minor aspect of deforestation we think that the social uh, aspect is more important uh, it, it, have you thought of uh, um uh, have you thought about uh, a strategy for these land patches uh, like of course uh, these many areas uh, of course uh, are under an analysis of biodiversity of, of for example uh, and so uh, there are uh, areas that are of very important biodiversity uh, and are corridors uh, uh, of course, this is part of the analysis and also has an impact on the final uh, strategy. And Manuela Chicanoi asks us, so what actions are uh, uh, taken uh, when you have areas up to 10 hectares for illegal crops? Well, as I said, uh, there have been analyses uh, Oh, there have been cartels of deforestation, investigations on underway. Of course, if we're talking about illegal crops, then of course, this is the uh, realm of uh, the attorney general office and, uh, and prosecutors. Uh, so uh, what i what i want to say here is that control and surveillance yes it's important but there should be also alternative crop production uh, forest uh, uh, development course that give benefits to the community so what i'm saying that is that for deforestation data help making the kind of analysis that leads to a better or the best strategy possible Control and surveillance, of course, as is one aspect of the others. Now, based on the experience you already have through the program you have implemented, how attractive are pay, uh, payment per environmental services? Uh, uh, as uh, we said, well, uh, 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 people are not saying i want to grow cro coca leaf uh, plants because i want to know it's an economic uh, issue and so these uh, alternative crops or these uh, program that uh, payment per uh, environmental services is another is an alternative option so uh people can understand that people do not have to engage in deforestation to grow something but they can there are issues or there are sorry there are options like uh, uh payment per environmental services that provide an alternative uh, and i said this is one of the of the different uh, eight ten uh, tools that we have uh, 
Uh, what uh, final remarks uh, could you provide uh, to all citizens and uh, knowing that we can all contribute uh, uh, to uh, uh, the fight against deforestation? Well, with this kind of analysis, with the um, uh, we do not have a single recipe to control uh, uh, the deforestation. The uh, the devil is in the detail. We need to uh, uh, see what the best option is for different regions. Antioquia has a university that are analyzing thoroughly the situation. The people in uh, uh, regional government can. Uh, be based on the uh, uh, result of this investigation to decide what the best uh, options are for the different region. So, so um, uh, also, for example, uh, one choice is to buy products that do not come from deforested areas of the country. One example. Uh, so. Uh, we all know that if we destroy the Amazon, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the impact uh, will uh, uh, terribly. If we, if we, if we use, uh, if we lose the Amazon, we lose the climate regulation. So there are many things that citizens can uh, do uh, based on this information. Uh, uh, there's a one final question. So several people are interested in. Uh, having more information on the program vision or vision amazons where can they get in touch with you very easy if you uh, vision amazonia dot com if you write uh, vision amazonia or vision amazon dot com that uh, will tell you where we stand uh, what we do, what we don't do, uh, you will find the emails uh, and you uh, will be able to get in touch with us. Uh, but uh, all these data of the deforestation are in the syst monitoring system of uh, forest and carbon, which is the official monitoring system of uh, Colombia and the IDM. Thank you very much, uh, Mebarak. Uh, very interesting to know about the robust uh, system that we have in the country. Well, there are different monitoring uh, systems in the world. And one of the more in, in, successful is the Initiative of Climate and Forest in Norway, known as NICFI. And we will talk about this too in the next uh, panel with two uh, international uh, guests. One of them is Magist Helen Backer Bruselius, uh, Master in. Uh, um, and uh, Charlotte uh, Bishop and uh, in 19 in uh, uh, Bogota and 416 uh, we we uh, welcome uh, Ellen and Charlotte uh, good afternoon for you in Norway good morning for us in Colombia you are welcome buenos dias good morning can you hear me yes Ye yes we can Thank you. Here. Thank you. Shall I just start my presentation and share my screen? Okay. Okay. Okay, we got it. <laughs> you got it. Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. My name is Ellen Bruselius Backer. I am the policy director for environmental integrity in Norway's um, International Climate and Forest Initiative. Thank you very much for inviting me here today to speak about our program on high resolution satellite imagery. Apologies for not speaking Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, I'm afraid, so we have to do with the translation. I'm going to talk about Norway's intention and ambition for the program on high resolution satellite imagery. And then a representative of the supplier, Mrs. Charlotte Bishop, will talk about the technical details of the program after me. So, Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative was initiated in 2008. We work in all tropical forest regions, in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, and in Southeast Asia. 
we work with tropical uh, forest country governments, multilateral institutions and civil society. And our aim is, together with our partners, to reduce and halt tropical deforestation and forest degradation, uh, protect biodiversity and enhance sustainable development. We work through several thematic strategies, as you see listed on the screen in white. And good information about the forest and what happens in the forest and to the forest is key to succeed in several of these um, uh, themes, such as sustainable land policies. You need to know where your forest is and what's happening to it. Transparency, obviously, for law enforcement. Knowledge about the forest and what happens to it really is the foundation a lot of the work that we do rests on. However, through our work with our partners, we realized that information about the forest is not always readily available. And that is why we have worked to support better information about tropical forests since the start of the initiative. We have supported uh, forest country governments. We've worked through the FAO, for instance, UN Red, of course, and civil society. But through this work, we also realized that there were hurdles in the access to data about the forest. Now, forest inventories uh, and plot data is obviously very good and has a lot of qualities, but it takes time, it's expensive, um, maybe uh, it's, it's difficult to cover vast areas, maybe there are even some areas you can't access, you aren't allowed the right to access them. And if you don't have historical plot uh, data, you can't travel back in time to get it. And satellite data has some advantages to address these uh, challenges. However, our reading of what we heard from our partners was that satellite data was not being used to the extent that it could. And countries did not get um, out of the data all the benefits that they could. There were challenges related to cost, because satellite data has been very expensive in the past. Um, and there were also challenges related to capacity, related to capacity to negotiate contracts, um, to apply licenses, which can be quite hard to understand. And also um, to use and share the data between institutions within the context of the licenses. So this is some of the background and some of the uh, challenges that we wanted to address with this program. So the intention for us behind the satellite procurement is quite clear. We want to provide a resource. We want to strengthen forest country governments. Governments are obviously a key actor when it comes to forest policies and land use policies. And we wanted to make sure that governments had the best resources possible to, so um, as the basis for their policy formulation and implementation. However, we also wanted to provide a resource to civil society, to the general public, NGOs, academia, so that we could enable the public discussion about forests and about land use, recognizing that um, public discussion needs um, a basis, a good factual basis to rest on. And finally, we are hoping to unlock innovation and initiative. Really, what can we achieve together when we have access to so much uh, information and data? So what's the intended uses of all this data? Like I said, it's for everyone. We really hope ev everybody can make use of this data. It's for governments, for civil society, NGO, academia, also private sector. Um, the contract has a broadly defined purpose to enable this broad use. And we're trying to make the data available so that it's useful irrespective of your level of technical capacity. So that uh, through some web portals, it's just an image that you can look at. That's helpful for some. And through other portals, it's more technical uh, data that's available that you can do your own analysis with. But we're really trying to make the data accessible through 
several channels so that we make it also helpful and useful for as many as possible. And I think Charlotte will talk a little bit more about this um, later. So what is the delivery really? What is this data? Right, um, the procurement covers all tropical landmasses between 30th, 30th degrees north and 30th degrees south. Um, it's high resolution, both in spatial and temporal terms. Um, the images are less than five meters resolution in spatial resolution. And there's a new mosaic every month from September 2020 onwards. And it's not just that um, some images in the mosaics are updated each month. No, it's the entire landmass, the entire mosaic is updated every month so that it's possible to follow the development also through a year. The procurement, um, in addition to these monthly mosaics, the procurement includes uh, an archive with biannual mosaics back to 2015. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, we're making the data available in several formats, including uh, visual and analysis ready mosaics. We hope that will be useful for several, um, several actors. And finally, uh, the contract has a duration of two years with a potential extension of one plus one year. So maximum total four years. Uh, that's the contract. Right, um, this is an evolving effort. We haven't done anything like this before. So we're learning as we're implementing. We're trying to make the visual mosaics uh, accessible via more and more platforms. And we're, uh, we've been initiating and conducting webinars to spread the word so that people know about this resource. There's a help desk that I'm also sure Charlotte will mention that's available um, uh, to users with, uh, with, who has troubles. And we've also user guides in several languages, including um, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese uh, and Bahasa. Uh, but I think I really want to stress that we also rely on our partners like you and our networks to talk about these data, to share experiences and share lessons learned from the application of the data. Because that's really how we can make sure that the data, people know about the data and that they're being used and that they are helpful. And that's um, the final thing I wanted to mention, because we realize that it's not enough just to make the data available. We also need to make sure that people who work with forest, forests and uh, land use know how to use the data. And the level of capacity in the various um, countries and civil society and institutions out there is, is quite varied. So we've also been mandated by our parliament to set up capacity building to make sure that these data is applied um, and is as useful as possible. And the parliament has specifically mentioned that first country governments and civil society should benefit um, from this. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any feedback or any uh, reflections or experiences in using the data, please don't hesitate to reach out because we really want to uh, make sure that this is a, a helpful resource that we put out there. Um, so I'm hoping to hear for you, from you with your experiences. Thank you very much. Ellen, muchísimas gracias por compartir esta información con nosotros, muy valiosa para poder aplicar algunas cosas. Y ahora sí Thank you for sharing this information. Um, it's all very va valuable. We're going to yield to Charlotte Bishop. She's a master's degree. And Charlotte, welcome. The, the floor is yours. And good afternoon to you. I will just share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you can see it. Yeah, we got it. Just putting it in presentation mode. No. no it's okay. Is this still working? 
yeah, it's working. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and you know, a pleasure to, to to follow on from from Ellen, who has introduced you to to the reasoning behind uh, why the NICFI data program came to be. And, and I will talk a little bit more about what we, as a project team, who have been given the the great honour to um, to launch this program and actually make this available to everyone what what it entails and and what's possible with this data um, and hopefully give you some some more insights that build so nicely on what ellen has already introduced us to so my name is charlotte bishop i am a senior project manager with kongsberg satellite services and we are a value added service provider for remote sensing data and also a ground station so we also talk to the satellites and work extensively with different satellite operators of which planet and airbus are two of those companies and and i will explain what our roles are in this program as we go through my short presentation excuse me charlotte yes we didn't see your presentation we don't know why Okay, okay. You just see you, but not your presentation. That's that's not so useful, is it? Okay, hang on a second. Let me see if I can find out what's happened here. Uh, okay, no, sorry. No problem. Let me try. No, it's okay, I think so. But yeah, no, it's okay. Okay. Wait, hang on. I just seem to have lost my mouse. My screen has... There we go, two seconds. Okay, so you can still see my slides. I will just check it's moving on. Yes, Excellent. it's working. Okay, thank you so much. Um, apologies for that, but that was just my title slide, so you haven't missed anything yet. Um, so I thought I would start with this slide because as, as Ellen has already mentioned, the, the data program that we're talking about today covers between 30 degrees north and south. But I think that's sometimes quite difficult to actually um, visualize what that looks like. So this, this image here, where you see the, the mosaic, the, the nice image that, that covers between those areas, that shows you that the full extent of the NICFI data program. And that's approximately 45 million square kilometers. That, as Ellen says, is not just covered in patches at a, at a monthly cadence or in archive, it is consistently covered uh, by this program. So every month, this entire region is covered, which I think is, is you know, it's, it's unparalleled really in terms of what is available. Um, and and I, I think very exciting in terms of what we can do with this data. So the benefit of having this type of data, this high resolution data, better than five meter spatial resolution, is being able to identify changes, not just at the, the large scale, but also at the small scale as well, and enabling users to act on that data and find a use for this data, regardless of the type of user. As we heard from Ellen, we want this to be as open as possible and to be able to be used by as many users as possible. And that includes anyone from indigenous populations to commercial users, NGOs, uh, governments, um, and, and everyone else in between, including, of course, the, the general public as well. Um, and in the following examples, I just have a couple of slides here just to show you this is, these are yearly changes. I will skip through them very slowly over this same area. So these are year to year changes over this area, but we're using exactly the same data that's available in this program. And what now we have through the program is an incredible richness of information by the virtue of having these monthly mosaics. So not just being able to look at an area at a perhaps uh, irregular review period because of just the nature of availability of data, being able to look at areas regularly, be able to better understand the challenges uh, and the changes in an area can help improve decision-making, our understanding, and of course, the mitigation to how we can approach conservation. So to introduce uh, us as partners, so uh, KSAT is the project prime. So we manage the, the, the NICFI data program. We are the service manager. So we ensure that um, not only all the users um, are, are happy that they have the materials that they need, that we have user guides and technical resources uh, as we have already heard about, but also that they understand 
the, the different ways that they can use the data and that, it, that there should be no barriers to how that data is used. But of course, we can't do this without the data that is so critical to this program. So by partnering with Planet, who is providing their fantastic base map resource from their Planet Scope satellite data sets, um, and providing the, the cadence level of imagery that we will discuss um, focuses on the core of the NICFI data program, as well as Airbus, who have a long heritage in providing satellite data at a range of spatial resolutions, and whose heritage historic archive data is extremely valuable for strategic partners. We won't, we won't focus a lot on the Airbus data today, um, but I will, I will mention that uh, as to why uh, when, we, when we get a, a little bit later on. So as Ellen mentioned, we have uh, different types of, of data product, products and, and also different ways of data. So we have a visual mosaic product, which is the, the, a, an image picture, essentially. So the, the map you see on the screen, the one I showed in my first slide, this shows the extent of the program again, but also is the standard visual mosaic um, display. So this would be predominantly in true color or natural color. So how you would see it normally on the ground with, with vegetation uh, displayed as green, it's provided non-downloadable, it's there for easy visualization. And, and again, to remove some of the barriers in terms of, of access and how to use these products by having something that's ready to use and can be visually, uh, visually pleasing and, and visually uh, analyzed easily. But we also know many users want to be able to download that data or analyze that data in their own tools. So we also have an analysis ready surface reflectance mosaic product that is fully terrain corrected. It is atmospherically corrected. And so it's normalized so it can be used for scientific analysis without degrading the radiometric quality of the data. And it is also provided in the full spectral range which means it also includes the infrared band, which is very useful for a lot of vegetative analysis. Um, and I'll show you some of the, the things that we can do within the tools for those users uh, who are less familiar with satellite data to get the real benefit of what this, um, this spectral information will provide. And we also talked about different cadence of the imagery. So we have an, an archive cadence, um, which is our biannual uh, mosaics, again, covering this entire region that we've been talking about from December 2015 to August 2020. And they are therefore uh, every six months we have those mosaics. And then monitoring, we have monthly monitoring from September 2020. Um, and then, as Ellen said, that will run up to a, a maximum of, of four years. But throughout that period, those monthly mosaics will be available. So once we get past six months, they don't get converted into a, an archive mosaic. So they will always remain as monthly mosaics from September 2020. So a, a really vast amount of data. We have, uh, I believe it's 18 or 19 mosaics that cover this whole region already available uh, for anyone to use. And we also have uh, different levels of access. Um, and, and this was designed specifically to enable different users, users who have different uh, levels of, of skill with using satellite data, but also to ensure that um, as many different platforms could also share and promote what the NICFI data program is doing. So we have a level zero access, which for most people, uh, they won't even know they're using level zero. This will be uh, where people will see this data in platforms like Global Forest Watch um, or some of the other tools, uh, as Ellen mentioned, um, such as with the, the UN FAO um, and, and other partners that we have who will be displaying this data, allowing users to use the data in their platforms with their additional layers without the need to download any software, download data, um, and be able to do analysis in the browser. And that is just a view only product. We then have our level one users, which is our largest group of users. This is, uh, at the moment, we have uh, six and a half thousand users at this level. So this really is the core 
of the NICFI data program. This covers everything I've mentioned to you already in terms of the, the mosaics, the data and the, the cadence level of imagery, but allows you to download that data. You're able to stream the data, you're able to make products. Even if you are a commercial entity, you are able to use this data within the bounds of the license for non-commercial usage. Um, and really there are, we have tried to reduce any of those limitations that have often prohibited or made it very difficult to uh, use satellite data, particularly commercial data on this kind of scale. You will see I have level two select partners um, grayed out, um, not so easy to read. Um, the reason for that is that that, that level is, is only for a very small number of users. Um, and those users are being identified as, as we go through this program. And those users will have access to not just the mosaics we've talked about, but also the underlying imagery, imagery that goes into making those mosaics. Um, and finally, they will have access also to the Airbus archive selected scenes across this region. Uh, the Airbus archive is, is not complete over the full area as it is with Planet, um, but it does provide this time series analysis back in time um, that will be accessible to a number of users. And we have a range of available resources. So we have a project page that is available to everyone. Um, I put the link at the top of my slide here and also the email address, which is the help desk. So KSAT provide tier one um, support, which is essentially general access support. We answer any questions that you have with regards to the program. The service runs 24-7 um, and it is possible to, you know, if you have a query about logging in or you are unsure how to download the data or you need more information on any of the products, um, you can contact us and we will be very happy to help. Um, and we have a range of other information on this page, including uh, the different links and tools to how to download or stream the data and the various uh, plugins and tools that you can use. And as Ellen says, we have that in a range of different languages, which of course includes Spanish. And I just wanted to spend my last few slides talking a little bit about how easy it is to interact um, with the data within the browser. Um, so once you have uh, signed up to the program, which you do at planet.com slash uh, very simple process and accepted the license terms, then you will be able to log straight into the Planet Explorer platform, which will look like this with your NICFI login. And on this page, and you hopefully just saw there is a red rectangle that has turned up at the bottom of my screen, there is a timeline at the bottom. So this is displaying by default the quarterly, um, sorry, the biannual mosaics. Um, and you can skip through them just by using the timeline at the bottom of the screen. And you can also use the magnifying glass. I will see if I can just put a pointer on. Um, me try and do it. Um, hopefully you can see my pointer now. Um, there is a magnifying glass in the top uh, left-hand side, which will allow you to, to search for, for, for data and the data sets. And you will find all of the NICFI products under the monthly tab. And there is a drop-down function here, which will allow you to select whether you want biannual or monthly mosaics under the NICFI program. And the list will populate with all of those that are available. There is also a button over here where you can add your area of interest. So you don't just have to browse to your area of interest. Um, you can upload a file to do this. So a shapefile or a KML file um, uh, or other geospatial information. And you can use that to zoom to your area of interest and, and just focus on the area important to you. You can also compare uh, images within the browser. So if you are less familiar with satellite data or you don't have the tools readily available to you, you can also look at change changes within the browser using the functions within the Planet Explorer tool. And there is a, a compare tool on the top right. And you can add in two different mosaics here. You see I have two different ones here from September and January. And you can slide between them and, and see the change. You can also measure the change as well, which can be area, size, for example. 
And you can also change the band combination. So we talked about natural color. Um, you can also change this to a more infrared display if you're used to using um, that kind of color display, which can be very useful for, for forest monitoring and vegetation. And you can also do a range of different indices. And these will use the, the different values within the data to calculate um, in this case, we're looking at vegetation index, so the greenness of the vegetation, which can give us an indication of health, um, but also help identify areas that have been cleared. And we also have, as I mentioned, different ways to download and stream the data. You can use this in, in ArcGIS and QGIS. There is a plugin uh, from Planet, which will allow you to access the NICFI data. Um, you can also use Python uh, and other, uh, other means of um, uh, you know, batch downloading and streaming those data sets if you're used to those. Um, and I put some links at the bottom of the screen here where you can find more information about how to do that. Or indeed, of course, if you're, if you're unsure, please do get in touch with the help desk. We're more than happy to, to direct you and provide guidance on that. And this is my last slide. I just wanted to include an example of, of how this data is already being used. Um, I could have chosen many examples. I thought this one was, was a nice one. Um, the, the MAAP group of the Amazon Conservation have been running a number of analyses across the Amazon in different parts of the Amazon. Um, in this case, this is in, is in Peru. Um, but they have been working in, in a number of areas and using the NICFI satellite data to help better inform and, and alert them of the areas of deforestation at a cadence level that they were not able to do before. Um, in this case, they've been using the Global Forest Watch tool. So again, not needing to download the data themselves, but being able to use functions already existing in other tools to uh, em enable them to be able to extract information that's still of great value to help target and understand the level and extent of deforestation. Um, so it is, was a very quick and, um, but I hope very a useful review of the technical side of the NICFI satellite data program. And I've added some, some links onto the, the slide here. Um, and absolutely, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have any questions. And, and I think myself and Ellen probably have a little bit of time for, for some questions now if, if there are any. So um, thank you very much. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a Ellen y Charlotte. Thank you, Ellen and Charlotte. We have a few questions for you that we will share right now. Thank you so much for the information that you have shared. The first question is, how important is technical cooperation for forest monitoring? Maybe that's a question that I go first. And then if you, Charlotte, want to fill me in later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Obviously, um, technical cooperation for forest monitoring is is very important. I think we have to learn from each other, and we have to make sure that we learn both from the success stories and from each other's mistakes. Because um, I think, to be fair and square, everybody knows this is difficult. I used to work with Norway's um, greenhouse gas inventory for the Lulu CF sector. So I know also that it's not always easy to, to make the calculations uh, right. But I think it's very important um, to share experiences and also to be each other's peer reviewers. That is embedded in the system under the Climate Change Convention. And I think it's also helpful to have a, a more running dialogue. Um, not just in the in the big formal processes, but also to be each other's um, friends and peers and help improve uh, our work. I think it's fair to say that this is work uh, and efforts that uh, there's always room for improvements and always room for thinking, you know, about the methods just once again. Um, so it's a work that sort of uh, never, never stops, um, but very rewarding work, I have to say. Thank you. Gracias, Ellen. Y tenemos otra pregunta, creo que también va dirigida más hacia ti, y es la siguiente. 
¿Cómo este tipo de iniciativas We have another question. How this initiative impact positively on developing countries? Okay, maybe I can answer this first um, from what we see on the on the project team side. Um, the what we have found from engaging with this program, from doing uh, a lot of outreach events, is that we are able to reach a number of developing countries who who didn't have access to this type of data or were unfamiliar on on how to use satellite data at all, and being able to work with them to help them understand how this program can be useful for them, what they can benefit from it, and, and also working with them exactly as uh, Ellen said previously, learning from each other and being able to uh, enable them and empower them as um, developing nations who have had these barriers to access previously to be able to actually use you know, get a, a lot of, of value and um, uh, you know, important information from this data to help them better inform their, their policies and procedures when it comes to, to conservation and sustainability. And I think that will continue as, as our program continues. And, and we are still seeing, uh, you know, even now moving towards a, a year into the program, it takes time for, for uh, countries and organizations to um, review the data and see the benefit that will, it will have. And I think we will see, continue to see more of these uh, fantastic use cases coming, coming out of this program. Gracias, Charlotte. Bueno, y tenemos... Thank you very much, Charlotte. We have several questions. So let's move to the next one. How can we have access to uh, a satellite image that Charlotte mentions? Okay, yes, no problem. So um, I will put it in the chat as well, but there is a, uh, a, a landing page that we have it's, um, open to everyone. You can, all you need is an email address and you can use your email address to sign up for the NICFI data program. Um, and then very quickly, it's just one activation step um, from uh, once you've signed up, an activation step to complete your registration, and then you will have access to the program. So to the, the to the vast mosaics we were talking about with that monthly cadence and the ability to download that all comes as part of that registration with free access, of course. Bueno, Charlotte, durante su presentación. During your presentation, your presentation, you have uh, um, uh, you have mentioned partners like Airbus. Uh, how, what is the relationship with the partners you have? How do they support you and vice versa? That's a great question. So we work very closely with with Planet and Airbus. We are we are a project team. We meet regularly. We discuss how we can outreach, how we can um, improve, learn from our users, how we can improve the materials that we share with um, with the users to help enable them better, to help remove any barriers that perhaps remain. Um, and, and this, we're learning as we go. It's very easy for us when we come from a, a more technical background to, to try to prepare materials that will be useful for everyone. Um, but we also know that, that we need to adapt um, a lot of these materials to, to better suit the different types of users that we have. So we're doing spending a lot of time um, following these engagements in, in doing that and engaging with those users directly. So we, we frequently have calls with the users, different user groups, um, workshop with, with users as well uh, to understand their needs and, and also ensure that they understand how, how this program can be useful for them. Muchas gracias, Charlotte. No sé Thank si, you eh, very much, Charlotte. I don't know whether Ellen wants to add anything. No, I just want to say thank you for your interest and I encourage you all to, to sign up to the website and get access to the images. I think that's what Charlotte and I and the rest of the team really want. Let Absolutely. us know if it works <laughs> and let us know if it doesn't work either. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias, Charlotte y Ele. Thank you, thank you very much, Charlotte and Ellen, for uh, your time and for sharing your knowledge with us. 
And after this very interesting panel, I want to encourage you to have a break. You can drink coffee or juice wherever you are and also wash your hands. So uh, we continue after the break with our fifth annual seminar. We'll see you in a minute.
Hola de nuevo a todas las personas que nos acompañan en el quinto seminario nacional. Uh, welcome again uh, to those of you with us on this fifth seminar. After this uh, short break, uh, let's continue with the, uh, the agenda. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind you that you can share your comments uh, on the uh, different uh, uh, social media hashtag Seminario Monitoreo Forestal. Ten uh, years ago, the uh, monitoring system on uh, forest and carbon was uh, started. We've been able to learn very much, and we will talk about this in the next panel. Ten years of lesson learned on the ongoing mon monitoring. Um, the, the, the director, uh, you, Lanza, will uh, be the uh, moderator of this uh, coming panel. Good morning, Andy, uh, uh, to you and uh, all of us. With us, more than 200 people have joined us since uh, eight in the morning, and uh, uh, I'm so happy that uh, we uh, can. Uh, talk now about the monitoring system in Colombia that is so important and that is part of the hearts of Colombian and of course of those who uh, contribute with the development of such system. Colombia is considered as a, a mega diverse country thanks to the natural forest and to its diversity. And we can say that our country is, uh, is mainly a forest country. According to our official data, the uh, forest uh, surface uh, is of 59.8 million hectares. We are talking about 52%, 52.5% uh, of the national territory much below the uh, national average, which is 32%. So the forests of Colombia, the biodiversity that exists in them is very important for us and the planet. However, deforestation is uh, placing at risk the natural uh, wealth and forest resources. So counting on update the deforestation uh, uh, monitoring system is key. Uh, uh, I IDEAM uh, 10 years ago, even more, uh, uh, 15 years ago, started thinking about uh, managing uh, uh, deforestation figures by through a monitoring system and keeping the uh, Colombian people well informed. This academic event allows us to celebrate 10 years of the monitoring system uh, on forest and carbon and uh, a system that has been uh, growing along the last 10 years uh, and uh, has allowed us to see the evolution of, of our country in the in the last 20 years in other words the system I I apart from having started 10 years ago uh, uh, the system covers also the information uh, dated back 20 years ago uh, we have uh, uh, been able together with other institute to engage in this mission uh, of developing the system we have therefore uh, uh, covered and followed on the behavior of forested carbon and uh, we have been uh, uh, reporting uh, uh, on uh, this information with different uh, documentation on a yearly basis or quarterly basis and weekly also information. Uh, you uh, use uh, this information according to your competence, your interest and to the level of detail provided but by our uh, published information. The early warning uh, on uh, deforestation have allowed uh, to identify the most important areas, uh, uh, nucleus of the country, which depends on climate uh, situation, location in the territory. We talk about the coast uh, and Caribbean region, uh, the more inland region, Catatumbo, the Amazon, 
uh, we talk about the Pacific region. And, and so we have the privilege to uh, uh, monitor all these different areas and all these uh, uh, diversity is available for all users across the whole country and we of Col as colombia of course have the commitment and duty to protect our natural wealth despite the technological in scientific uh, 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 evolution uh, of course uh, it requires uh, ongoing update so how can we coordinate uh, uh, and support uh, across the different uh, institutions and with the academia research groups local communities uh, in such a way that the information we produce can be better can be more useful uh, for or can be useful for institution, the com especially the communities that live in the forest, so that we can uh, strengthen the governance at local level. Thanks to the information again provided by DM in a transparent way. We will be listening to the people who are expert in these different areas. Uh, people uh, have uh, have more than five, ten, or fifteen years of experience. So uh, we uh, can rely on decades of research. And so if you allow me, I will uh, introduce uh, our uh, uh, panelists. Let's start uh, our uh, introduction with our leader, Everlildis Cordoba Borja, Borja, a leader who is the legal representative of the Community Council of Black Communities of the Rio Tolo Basin and Cocoma Sur area. Uh, uh, black leader, defender of equity and human rights and equality as well. Uh, she's a single mother. She has worked during nine years as general coordinator of Cocoma Sur, uh, seeking on an ongoing basis the inclusion of women in the decision making uh, mechanism i feel that she represents uh, the women of her area and also implemented the first red plus uh, project of the country uh, uh, according to international standards as well as other project of conservation on forest, sea turtles, water quality. In 2020, she was elected as legal representative of Cocoma Sur, and she has continued to lead the processes to claim territorial rights, uh, working with uh, uh, women and men in the community council and uh, uh, fostering the uh, um, participation uh, we all have something to learn from her let's continue with the introduction to professor jose miguel uh, if you uh, uh, i'd like to say that you one of the um, uh, leader in, in the uh, forestation area. Uh, uh, we'd like to thank you for leadership in the protection of forest. Uh, Professor uh, Jose Miguel Orozco Munoz from the District uh, District University San Jose Socalza is, is a forest engineer of the uh, Jose uh, the Caldas University Master in Los Angeles University, Dean 
of the uh, Faculty of Environment and uh, uh, writer on El Tiempo. I'll summarize your experiences so that we we cannot, of course, mention everything. He's, a, he's head of the Forest Division, consultant to the forest governance in Colombia, professor of the district university in the area of forest policies and forest uh, uh, governance in the forest engineering uh, faculty. Let's continue with uh, Aura Robayo. Uh, she's advisor. Uh, she's advisor uh, uh, to the uh, embassy of Norway's uh, master degree uh, in uh, forest resources. More than ten years of experience in red. Plus, uh, another woman who has worked in rural development, uh, natural forest, uh, international cooperation project, and. Uh, we end our presentation our introduction with uh, Mr. Montenegro. Uh, he is a coordinator of the uh, he has a long experience in uh, uh, digital image processing. Uh, applied to meteorology, meteorology, meteorology. He gives example to young scientists who think about how to protect forests in Colombia. He is a coordinator and works on the yearly report uh, on, on climate change. Uh, uh, scientist who has been work and leading, been working and leading his team in uh, uh, a central, regional, and local level. You are all welcome to uh, this uh, panel. After this brief uh, introduction of the uh, panel members, let's uh, uh, start with our conversation. Uh, we would like to hear you speak uh, and there uh, as leader of the forest uh, uh, um, topic uh, in Colombia. Analysis are done at central, regional and local level. How uh, uh, can you, how do you uh, coordinate this uh, process uh, with the data that are also generated by uh, IDEAM. How, how can we uh, coordinate and best use uh, the official information provided by IDEAM? How can that help uh, the different organization, the different institution, and therefore create more efficiency? We would like you uh, to uh, speak about this. This is Angie speaking. Ariel, this year microphone was off. Good morning, everyone. This is Ariel speaking. I don't think it's so positive that I am I'm first because oh dear, it's scary to have to talk first in this very important conversation. However. It is true that what brings us together this morning is a conversation on the topics that interest us most and that we like most. So I want to thank you for this invitation to my fellow panelists. I'm so pleased to be with you this morning. To all of you, Ederson, Profe, Yolanda, so glad to see you leading this initiative. Now, delving into the matter of how the data can be coordinated and used and what is it good for and what we do, what is it good for? We need to find sense and meaning to what we do. 
Otherwise, it won't be useful. And over these years in which we've been having this dialogue and trying to understand and trying to know things better, I think that what we have achieved is being able to understand what data is good for. Now, one can produce uh, a great deal of data and simply store it away. So data needs to be given meaning and sense. And that has been the task that we've set ourselves to over the last years. IDEM and uh, through the different processes and support processes, what they have been trying to do is to share what they do in simpler terms and easier terms. And this has allowed those of us who work with communities to truly base what we do on data. Quickly, I will say this. Communities are generating data constantly. We are constantly looking at whether the trees have been felled or they have not. And there's a gap between having that data and using that data. So it's important to understand and to have been able to understand that in having a constant dialogue with EDM and in reporting this data, what we're doing is feeding the national monitoring system. That's where data starts to take on meaning. And that's how it's important to understand not only how data is generated, but also how it can be used so that those of us who work with data and with the communities can use it better. Yolanda speaking. Thank you very much, Evreldis. Now we will hear from Aura Roballo. This is Aura speaking. The director greetings and to my fellow panelists greetings to Evreldis, Ederson and Jose Miguel. I especially want to congratulate IDEM because we've had the forest monitoring system for 10 years now, and I think this is an important step forward for the country at large. So congratulations to IDEM. Now, regarding the question on how the forest monitoring system fits in with what we do in institutions, well, I work with the Norwegian embassy, and what we use the system for is to speak a common language, both locally and internationally, where the forests are, where deforestation is happening. And I think that's what the forest monitoring system has enabled. It has enabled a common language. As regards our cooperation with Norway, our main focus is payment per results. And in having data that is transparent, that is easy to compare, that is permanent, it's much easier to set joint cooperation goals and understand how we are advancing in those goals. For example, for the reduction of deforestation. Lastly, I wanted to mention that mo almost all of our portfolio will for cooperation with Norway is based on IDEM generated data. For example, we are working with the uh, traceability chains for cacao, oil palm, um, and others. And none of this would be possible if we wouldn't have trustworthy information as we do provided by the monitoring system. So thank you so much. Yolanda speaking. Thank you, Aura, for your contributions. Erson, please, you have the floor. This Erson speaking. Thank you, Director Yolanda. Special greetings to my fellow panelists, to Eldis, to Aura. And thank you for your support, Aura, with the embassy. Also, greetings to Professor Orozco. 
one of the prominent figures when it comes to force in Colombia. It's a, an honor to have you this morning. What Everaldiz and Aura have said is very important. And I want to touch upon what Everaldiz mentioned regarding real-time information. When we talk uh, in academia or institutionally about information and how it is the result of different protocols and methodologies, the truth is that real information is on the ground in the, in the forests that are the sustenance of communities. And um, yes, we need to be in touch with the the information, the real-time information to provide valuable information too. And in that regard, EDM has a great deal of uh, history with what we what we know as the climate observers. People who wake up in the morning, they have their breakfast, they go to the meteorological watch station and they provide information based on their readings and measurements. And that's what we should do with forests as well. We should go back to the real time monitoring. La Sadly, Bogota is large, large city like many other cities across the country and in the cities, uh, the forests are not taken into account in our decision-making processes. But if we go back to to the information, to real-time information, we will be able to uh, give forests the, the, the role that they should play in our decision-making. So in that sense, it's very important that we go back to the basics. We go back to real-time information. Also, natural forests are the key, are the key to the present, not the future, but to the present so that we can attain our current goals, as Aura mentioned. Without our natural forests, without the communities that live in those forests, we won't be able to attain the goals that we have set for ourselves come 2030. Colombia is key in that sense because most greenhouse gas emissions are a result of deforestation and what we're doing to our natural forests. So again, if we want to attain the ambitious goals that we have set for ourselves, we need to go back to the basics, back to the forest, back to measuring in real time as a national government and in our cooperation with international cooperators and international partners, we need to come back to the forest. Everaldis, the community she represents, they know what's going on with the forest. And our monitoring data should be real-time data, real-life data. And that's how we should all participate in academic processes and scientific processes and ensure that we have the necessary data that will allow us to know whether or not we're meeting our goals. I also want to give a word of encouragement. So many regions across the country that are suffering from the COVID pandemic, I myself, have felt the loss. And this is an invitation for us to think about our neighbors, to think about our partners, and to keep in mind all of our collective needs in our decision making. And with this, a very special greeting from the heart. Yolanda speaking, thank you, Ederson, for your thoughts not just around the pandemic, but also the need to care for our natural resources and the forests and real-time information extraction. Now, Professor Jose, so we've talked about the use of information in the communities and how they help produce some of the information and how we need to speak a common language and how shared information allows us to do that. 
we've talked about how important it is to keep in mind forests in our decision making in the big cities. That's the thoughts, uh, that's the summary of the thoughts that our panelists have shared. So now we yield to you and your thoughts on this question, Jose Miguel. Jose Miguel speaking. Thank you to IDEAM for this invitation. Thank you to its director for your, her generous remarks in the beginning. It is a reason to be proud to know that you are at the helm of the Institute, Director Yolanda. And of course, it's also a pleasure to be here this morning with colleagues and panelists, uh, Ederson, Aura, Everaldis. I'm very proud to be representing forest engineering in this panel. Amongst others, I have had the fortune of participating in the four previous seminars before this one. And for that, I am grateful. I would have a number of things to mention, but perhaps most noteworthy is the following. So this panel is set to talk about the 10 years and main takeaways over that period of this process. In that regard, I would point out the enormous contribution of the GHG monitoring system and its contribution, as I said earlier, to the forest management, pro proper forest management in the country. I, before my current post, worked uh, or have worked at Inderena as the chief of forests. And in that experience, I saw firsthand how deforestation is measured. There was one measurement back in 1976 as a result of the study carried out by CONIF. And at the time, they talked about a loss for, for the last, for the previous 30 years, between 1946 and 1976, they talked about, about a loss of 20 million hectares in those 30 years. Afterwards, Inderena also carried out an estimate in about 1984. And back then, they calculated that between 1968 and 1984, the loss had been of 15 million hectares of forests. Now, for the Inderena estimate, what they did was they compared forest mapping. They had worked with the Mapping Institute, the Agustin Colasi Institute. And that's how the system that we have now is a huge step forward in terms of precision, in terms of analysis. We went from night to day, so to speak, in terms of our monitoring capability. And as Everaldis mentioned, what's important now is to use that information that we are being able to produce thanks to the system so that all actors and stakeholders can participate in forest governance so that we can better manage the forests. In that regard, 
this morning with uh, Ellen and Charlotte's presentation and NICFI. Uh, well, what they mentioned and the availability of information is a huge, is a huge opportunity for the country to continue making strides in this regard. So that's how I do think that uh, we need to acknowledge and applaud IDEAM's contribution through the forest and carbon monitoring system because it is a very important tool that more actors need to use and of course each of them they need to use it within their roles within their missions also communities also forest users in different contexts that's what i wanted to point out i think this is very important and this is a huge step forward a very important result thank you engineer orozco Okay, so after the engineer's remarks, we have had now know a bit of the history of force monitoring. What we know now is we have the data, we have the information. We'd like to ask that you please tell us what are the challenges in forest and deforestation monitoring? Which do you think are the new challenges that are being faced in monitoring deforestation in Colombia? And as experts, what do you think should be the appropriate flow of that information, either from the nation to the local level or from the local level to the national level? Of course, as the EDM team, we are very expecting of what you think are the challenges that are faced in terms of information flow. In that regard, this time around, for this question, if you agree, why not begin with Engineer Orozco? Go ahead, Engineer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that uh, during all these years, uh, there has been an improvement in the quality of the process, uh, the, uh, the the information that uh, uh, presented by Jose Juni is very accurate, uh, detailed, and very useful to to to. It's very useful to to have the uh, uh, science-based uh, elements that allow for uh, uh, informed decisions. And so, I, I do believe that the I do believe that the role played by the monitoring systems, this monitoring system. Uh, uh, can be uh, adjusted, can be improved by adjust this, adjusting the information. For, for, for example, the issue of causes uh, of the uh, deforestation, the, the, the new technology allow to be aware of elements that have impact on the deforestation. But I do believe that there's that is quite an area for improvement in order to have not only the deforestation data, but to the extent possible, accompany such data by identifying uh, uh, the causes uh, in the different region of the country. Obviously, uh, uh, obviously, identifying the causes may be difficult according to the region where that uh, analysis is made, but. Uh, for example, uh, 
uh, the, for example, one reason is the dispossessment of land. And if that is one source, one cause of deforestation, well, then uh, uh, one can then uh, uh, adopt uh, strategies uh, that uh, tend to this uh, misappropriation of land. Uh, now that the uh, technology I is available, uh, and that this is something that may also the President of the Republic uh, mentioned uh, uh, in one of his speeches in Leticia, he talked about the herding uh, of land. So focusing on these uh, causes uh, can be key for the uh, fight against the deforestation. Moreover, there are three main pillars, uh, which are the monitoring system of deforestation and carbon, the national forest inventory, uh, of which we will hear during this event, and the forest national information system, the legal instrument uh, uh, that sets the scope of this three pillar, uh, which is decree 1655. Uh, uh, that decree sort of uh, coordinates or provides information on how to coordinate the different pillars that I have mentioned. And, and I think the inventory is the inventory somehow has moved forward in a more speedy way than the monitoring system because the monitoring system not only examines uh, uh, where uh, there are uh, illegal uh, aspects like illegal crops or illegal mining that that the system has to also coordinate with areas where the illegal uh, uh, activities take place. The last report we have on forest uh, information, I think is of the year 2012, and we are now in 2021. So the challenge for IDEAM is to better coordinate uh, or, or better or, or update the uh, national uh, forest information so that the monitoring system together with the, with the forest inventory can uh, be more as, how can we say, on the same level uh, uh, in, in order uh, to uh, use the uh, forest information as a more active uh, instrument, um, active tool. So I think the, these uh, is to be considered. Now, another aspect, uh, would be the forest governance in the sense that uh, it is recognized that uh, among uh, 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 there is a close relationship between the uh, monitoring the inventory and the governance so uh, i think these element uh, of forest governance should be uh, taken into consideration so one aspect is to deepen uh, in the uh, causes of deforestation so that uh, the information on the causes is more accurate. And the other challenge uh, is not for the system, but for IDEAM as such uh, to, uh, to sort of uh, uh, have a more balanced level of inventory and in forest information, because it is evident uh, that uh, there is quite a gap that has to be filled. This is what I would uh, highlight as challenges for the future. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Jose Miguel. Uh, I would give uh, the floor to the other uh, uh, people. Of course, your, uh, uh, your uh, comments are very important. Uh, uh, Aura may uh, uh, contribute with uh, her intervention, of course, of course, director. 
Well, I, I, my points are a bit similar to those uh, uh, mentioned by engineer Jose Miguel. What is the more important uh, challenge? Uh, the, how do we include the information with uh, forest governance? How can forest governance uh, can use the high quality information provided by IDEAM? The information must be uh, useful for what happens on territorial level. Is it, in other words, the relationship between communities, organization, uh, so, social civil, civil society organization, so that the actors in the territory can use such information for the different uh, uh, actions being uh, implemented in the territory. Uh, granting uh, the rights of use, which is also that has been discussed by by uh, this government, granting of use for local community, and uh, 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 and uh, also in the application of sanctions in the fight against illegal deforestation, and uh, and I think that uh, IDEAM has uh, made progress, and then one important. Uh, part of the seminar will be how to follow up on the conservation agreements vis-a-vis -vis the communication channel if it should be from the regional to the local or from the central to the regional i think the monitoring system is complex because it complies with different objectives the information of the national level is very important when it it, it uh, is uh, in communication with foreign countries like Norway for international cooperation uh, purposes and UN international treaties and agreement. So that kind of information at central level is important for that uh, in that case. In, instead, there is a different kind of information that is important for the regional and local level because of course uh, the uh, communities the people who live in the forest are those who can best assess the local uh, information and uh, and so that information must be moved from the uh, territory from the local level to the central level so despite the complexity of the system I do believe that uh, two-way channels can be established uh, in order to uh, fulfill all purposes. And to end, I would like to say that another challenge is the monitoring of uh, forest degradation and the, uh, the uh, use of soil in a more broad sense not only uh, the degradation, but also the emission level. This is what I could say with regards to your last question. Thank you very much. Let's continue then uh, with uh, Everildis. Uh, let's listen to your uh, contribution. And of course, uh, we, will, uh, we are uh, uh, taking duly notes of what you are saying. I believe that uh, uh, Professor Jose Miguel and Aura, uh, I, I have said have said things that I don't want to repeat, but uh, on which I'd like to build on. In terms of challenges, I think the challenge is uh, that I can understand the country in different ways because we uh, have, you know, multi multi cultural uh, variety so the data must contribute to solve the issues of different areas because i can have there they can, there can be different causes of the defore deforestation but information is generalized then that doesn't allow me to uh, precisely and specifically solve my local problem so uh, so the, the challenge exists not only for IDEAM, but for uh, all deforestation uh, system 
that exist across the country. The information that is being produced either by sector or by region or however uh, it can be gathered, that uh, information must have an impact on the final solution. We cannot uh, uh we cannot divide the uh decision making me mechanism uh, at a different level because when you go to a mayor's office or a governor office the, that office that governor office or mayor's office doesn't know what is happening at local level with respect to the first session and they are the decision makers they are the ones who have to uh, deal with the problem at local level so so that the, so the information must uh, be accessed accessed uh, at the local level for decision making purposes on the other hand uh, we must be aware that uh, we cannot uh, solve everything and that the information will not solve everything so uh, where there is a willingness uh, uh, that is where we can uh, uh, strengthen furthermore by providing uh, the inform uh, information. I say this because of what has happened in the last year when we did not know that IDEAMA could help us with information uh, based on data uh, so that we can have more local uh, uh, information. We believed uh, that we had to look for people who could pay for very expensive imagery when we understood that the edm could provide that information for us it was easier to uh, uh, be able to analyze the situation and uh, and uh, Oh, 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 and this is where i started having an ongoing uh, a dialogue uh, with people saying look we didn't understand this we did not understand that so relying with the support uh, when people are really interested in solving problems at community level well that is important so uh, so so there are at community level people who can be involved in uh, implementing the use uh, of the information so that uh, at local level we can achieve uh, a, a, a transformation that can of course be supported by different levels either department or central level so the coordination is something that is useful when of course uh, uh, at every level there is a willingness to help and cooperate and uh, implement uh, the transformation. So I, I believe that uh, uh, the EDM can help uh, in the sense that the information that the EDM is producing can be taken into account by all decision making uh, unit across the country. So, uh, so we cannot have a separation between the different decision making units because each one of these uh, a body uh, as a play as, as a role to play thank you very much uh, to Everildis. we have uh, nine minutes left and our great challenge uh, is some guiding uh, principle uh, across uh, the uh, for all actors uh, uh, across the whole territory we are um, uh, making notes of uh, the challenges you have uh, highlighted and uh, uh, in terms of uh, the causes and agent uh, uh, at regional level, at central level, at local level, the good news is that uh, um, the issue of forest has become a priority for the uh, current government. Uh, uh, for the Ministry of Environment, for the President himself, uh, the Ministry of Health is uh, 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 helping us and providing its support to us, to IDEAM. And, and uh, 
there are more and more people being appointed uh, to work with us. That's as a good news. Interoperability platform, information, uh, field work. We are monitoring also the planting of the 100 and uh, 80 million uh, trees uh, that is all these are priority of the ministry of the environment and of the uh, current government uh, and 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 um, co international cooperation is also important now let's move to our last uh, question what uh, would be for our uh, panelists from the embassy the role of the international cooperation in the monitoring system uh, 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 try to an uh, answer quickly that was the question for aura for mr orozco how does the academia use uh, the uh, information in education process uh, you from you too we would we would like to have two or three sentences no more for ever ladies ever ladies uh, what is the suggestion for monitoring data to um, be an input for the environmental information so that it contributes to the knowledge of the actual situation of our forest. For engineer, engineer Ederson, what, uh, which of the challenges uh, based on all the background, uh, what question would you ask uh, engineer anderson compared to 15 years ago what would you like to see in 15 years from now just two sentences so let's give the floor to aura first very briefly i think the first sentence or word is the the fact that transparency is strategic for colombia and for the donors for nicfi uh, of course uh, colombia is a strategic partner and uh, we will uh, contribute uh, uh, in, in with uh, uh, technology to help uh, uh, our partner countries and we will continue supporting uh, colombia through different initiatives like vision amazonia sustainable colombia fund uh, uh, and we will uh, support idm and other institutions in their effort uh, uh, to uh, uh, strengthen uh, the monitoring system. Th thank you very much. Beautiful sentences that uh, really uh, make us feel motivated. Thank you very much. I'm happy about the news of a uh, number of professionals being um, hired to in increase uh, uh, the workforce in this uh, area información para toda la actividad que en materia de, de investigación y de educación y también de extensión adelanta la, la, la academia eh, poder tener a la mano of esos course in the, in, in the area um, uh, there are different fields uh, where the information can be uh, uh, applied in different kinds of research work uh, work uh, uh, the Colombian uh, uh, review publishes uh, uh, article, uh, scientific articles that are uh, from uh, national and international authors, uh, and that where uh, we uh, mention uh, the uh, source of information, uh, which in this case is the monitoring system. And in the future, I think that I would stress what uh, a colleague Aura said. Uh, the challenge is to use uh, better uh, this information in the perspective of forest governance. And as Edison said as well, uh, it is key to use uh, all this information at all levels and be able, based on that, to contribute to the analysis of forest management from a forest governance perspective, which is totally relevant. And there is that is a challenge for the academia, included information in these processes seen in a 
comprehensive way in terms of transparency, access, participation, etc. So I think that these uh, are the um, um, key point uh, to involve uh, the uh, uh, information uh, with the activity uh, developed by the academia in the area in the area of research and education. Thank you so much, engineer. We're ready for you, Everaldis. This is Everaldi speaking. Well, I think that what follows is that we need to keep training and recognizing communities as important sources of data for the national monitoring system and support the communities so that they can, can continue to feed this information. I think this task would give wonderful results because in my point of view, to provide uh, technical tools to the communities will always be very positive. This is Yolanda speaking. Now you have the floor, Engineer Ederson. How do you envision the monitoring system in 15 years' time? Thank you very much, Yolanda. This is Ederson speaking. And thank you to my fellow panelists. I think what you have mentioned provides a guide to how we should focus our ensuing efforts. And I would highlight two things that you all have said in different ways. One thing is the effective use of the information, and EAM should promote such use. Yes, we can provide daily alerts, but if the information isn't used, it doesn't make sense. So we need to use the information effectively in the local, regional, and national context. And now Aura said this, and so did Jose Miguel. We've moved and made progress in the at the national level and the regional level, and yet locally we still have strides to make. And that's where I point out the second thing that my colleagues have mentioned, which is capacity building. In capacity building, I mean, not just at the scientific and technical level regarding the monitoring system, but also capacity building at the local level. So not only the communities can produce the information, but also use it, as, as I said earlier. And something that is key is the technologies that we have developed already we have done this already to some extent with Tomaju and Manji. We have supported sustainable forest management processes at the local levels. That very same setup is something we should try to implement in other regions like the Magdalena Medio, Santa Marta, Sierra Nevada, the Amazon, and even the Pacific. Because when people start to own the knowledge to to use it effectively, they will better conserve and preserve forest areas. When communities do not use the information, it's simply information that is out there that doesn't connect to communities, realities. So we need not only, uh, we need to to improve and uh, do capacity building as well, as well as to effectively use at the national level. We've done this to some extent, do it more at the local level. And again, thank you to my fellow panelists. Yolanda speaking. Engineer, thank you so much. We, of course, have said already that the pandemic has opened up a door to rethink our current situation. Since we have so many different regional contexts, we have the mountain ranges, we have the coastline, we have the tropical forests, 
and we have populations living in urban areas but also in rural areas so i'd like to ask that you all do the following now that we're using water to wash our hands so often i'd like to ask that you do the following that you open the faucet and close it immediately and think about how it makes you feel how it makes you feel when you're not getting that water from the faucet and based on that feeling think back to the forest and how the forest means life now mr gavis has talked about sustainable productivity mr gavis to address this question we ask that you please join us on the third day of this event someone else has asked about the forest inventory this is a huge challenge that minister correa has set for uh, his term in providing a forest inventory which will be submitting by faces this has been the result of very uh, dedicated work by engineer claudia and by the Sinche von Humboldt Institute. We ask that to answer this question and for the detail, you join us tomorrow for the forest inventory section. And that we may all find together a more adequate word to refer to forests. When we talk about having food on our tables, we talk about food security. Y queda en sus corazones. ¿Cómo la orientamos en los bosques? Si estamos hablando. How can we translate this to the forest realm? Hey. Let's think about this. I leave you with that thought. I want to thank you for for participating this morning. Thank you to our panelists, IDEAM community and academia represented, as well as international cooperation. Thank you to our partners who have constantly believed in the ministry to our technical experts for the work you've done over the last 5, 10, 20, and 30 years. And for the love that Colombians feel for IDEAM, thank you all. Have a good day, everyone. Director Yolanda, thank you so much for moderating the panel. And to our panelists, thank you so much. In the first day of the fifth seminar. I'd like to highlight what Andrea has said, how the pain has uh, to, find a, to find a new appreciation for nature. Now, would like for our attendees to look at the strategies that are being implemented in other countries. For this, Jimena Herrera. Y ocupa el cargo de especialista en técnica del gobierno de Ecuador. Jimena, Ecuador, gracias, and gracias. And a technical expert working mm -hmm. for the Ecuadorian government. Bueno, mientras Jimena se conecta, yo le recuerdo well, well, que we'll pueden... Jimena, a few moments to connect. I, if I may remind attendees Aquí abajo, en los de to YouTube, leave their comments, to make sure you comment on social networks under the hashtag Seminario Monitoreo Forestal. I also want to remind you that on the YouTube channel, you, you and then the link, you will find a link to sign up where we will be sending you the memoirs of this seminar. Jimena is with us already, so Jimena, we yield to you. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jimena Herrera. I'm a technical expert in forest monitoring and inventories. I work for the Environment and Water Ministry as part of the National Monitoring Forest Systems in Ecuador. And thank you so much for inviting me to talk about our experience. Next, I will share my screen. Now, this morning I had some internet issues. And so I am moved to turn off my camera to make sure that I can share uh, my screen. Sí, sí, vemos tu presentación. Sí. 
Estamos we can see your screen. We're seeing your presentation. Hey, Mena. Listo. Listo. Muchísimas gracias. Como les decía, yo voy a hablarles sobre la experiencia del monitoreo. Excellent. De Good morning. I'm going to tell you about the experience for forest monitoring in Ecuador. We'll talk a bit about what the system is about, under what norms it operates and policies. Also, some of the process, how it started, the components that make up the National Forest Monitoring System, the one since 2014, and the main challenges face as part of this endeavor. I'll give you some data. Something regarding the relationship between people and the forest from different entities in Ecuador. 44% of Ecuador's population depends directly on forests, either because they live in a rural area, because they uh, cook using wood, because they use the, the, the river, amongst others. In Ecuador, we have 24 provinces with about 12.5 million hectares of forest cover, according to the latest 2018 measurement. 49% of those uh, forests belong to indigenous peoples. And 54% of our forest cover is in the Amazon region. Our gross deforestation in continental Ecuador, There's, this is data as to how we've lost our forests since 1990. Up to 2017, 2018, we're talking about 82,500 hectares on a yearly basis, which is a minus 66% annual loss in this period of time since 1990. The provinces with the greatest deforestation are Manabí, Morona and Santiago, all three of them in the Amazon region. Except for Manabí, which is in the coastal region. This is mainly the result of changes in land use for uh, agrarian use and then for different types of crops. As I said earlier, some historical data, we have decreased the trend and yet deforestation is still high as regards our cover, our forest cover. So with this data, uh, a certain number of policies were proposed where the government and the state tries to protect the forests and the environment. So that's we have a national strategy on climate change and a national strategy for biodiversity. And all these need information, both for their ongoing development and to measure the impact of their policies. In addition to that, there are certain areas, geographical areas, that are overseen by the Ministry for the Environment and Water. We're talking about wetlands, paramos, mountains, as well as protected areas and conservation areas, as well as some areas that belong to the state and that are granted to indigenous communities and peoples. We also have programs and projects that have different scopes, including amongst them the forest usage system and the forest control system. As I said, they each also have their own information needs. And they all have the need to constantly monitor the state of forests. We also have a number of tools that help us in the proper management of our national forest system. We have an administration system, a control system, and then monitoring system, of course. 
Also, Ecuador has acquired a number of commitments regarding the environment, like the UNFCC, uh, the UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol, another agreement back in, 20, in 2008, a national environmental policy in 2009, a climate change strategy starting 2012, the Red Plus initiative after the Paris agreements in 2016, another agreement in 2017, and a number of laws regarding agrobiodiversity and sustainability starting 2017. Now, regarding the Red Plus initiative, as you know, Red Plus is very important in Ecuador especially when it comes to policy re uh, around uh, climate change. As you know, the initiative uh, has a number of requirements whereby the countries voluntarily that want to launch some of these initiatives first need to have a national monitoring system, a national, a national action plan, MRD, which is monitoring report and MRV and verification system and a response system. So what are the objectives for Red Plus in Ecuador? To integrate national policies and strategic uh, sectors to uh, reduce forest degradation and deforestation to protect our resources and to protect age long knowledge. So this is the initial preparation phase where we set a benchmark safeguard system and the monitoring systems, not just for Red Plus, but also for our climate change and forest management initiative. This is how we uh, drafted a project and program, which is the Pro Amazonia program, to help us in this endeavor. And we're in the, currently in the payment for results phase. And Ecuador has been acknowledged for its achievements in bringing down greenhouse gas emissions thanks to payment for results. This with the support of uh, both German and Norwegian support and their recognition for reductions attained in, between 2015 and 2019, as well as the payment for results program. Thanks to the Green Climate Fund after reductions attained in 2014. And Red Plus also contributes to meet national commitments and goals for climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as the attainment of the SDGs. Now, REM is a national program, but is currently being implemented also in the coastal region. We have Pro Amazonia. BPR 2014, which will have a national scope in a few years, and then other important uh, stakeholders that are participating in this action plan, like the water funds in the north, center, and south parts of the country, as well as the PASTASA program. Now, specifically related to forest monitoring and activities in forest monitoring, well, up to 2019, the Ministry of Environment and Water was in charge of continuously monitoring forests according to what is enshrined in the Constitution where nature is a nature, nature is a right in and of itself. Now, the ministry changed names, but it has the same functions and the new challenges that it faces, giving this transition. However, in the organic environmental code, which is our governing set of laws, 
the ministry is responsible for keeping the inventory updated, the deforestation rates and the ecosystems. There are a number of articles within the code for the environment. It's a set of laws and norms, which is yet another text that governs these efforts. And then there are a number of commitments at the ministry level that have continue to support these efforts in developing our forest monitoring system. Now, this means that the state is in charge not only of monitoring, but also of um, following up and producing uh, guidelines for proper follow up. Now let's talk about the national uh, uh, monitoring system. Before 2009, there were no national project, uh, uh, only uh, sporadic or localized uh, efforts to obtain information. So since uh, uh, 20, uh, eight or nine, uh, we started uh, uh, collecting information on the uh, forest uh, cover vegetation maps, uh, uh, also distribution of the ecosystem and the uh, forest uh, um, nation project. This in the framework of uh, ministerial agreements. And after 2014 really is when a national system of forest stars uh, working uh, within a monitoring unit that we we engaged in uh, several uh, uh, project uh, producing information and giving continuity to the uh, prior uh, information project so we generate the uh, maps uh, of covered uh, air units of uh, monitoring information on ecosystem, fragility of ecosystem, and national database on vegetation, uh, and different uh, uh, CO2 uh, elements, related elements, and also biodiversity and uh, other institutions uh, were included in our work. This is a, a timeline. Uh, the, we we're talking about uh, 10 years. We started in 2009. Uh, and so we've been uh, working, as you can see in the timeline, with uh, ending with the current national system. In 2018, uh, um, uh, uh, as of 2018, we started strengthening the national system with the support of the uh, German international cooperation, uh, trying to strengthen the methodologies used to monitor monitor forest. We updated the second level of reference with a different period and based on calculation of historic data of deforestation. And uh, we started with the pilot project of four early warnings. And in 2021, 20, we are now in the process of evaluating the second level of references, uh, a proposal, uh, a proposal for uh, future implementation and also certification with the support of the Ministry of Agriculture related to sustainable uh, production, which needs monitoring. And then uh, also what we call payment per performance, uh, which is uh, a uh, initiatives to reduce uh, deforestation. And this is done with the financial uh, uh, um, fund from uh, the Ecuadorian government. And we have also carbon zero program, which uh, uh, has to establish the uh, 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 guidelines, so especially in the area of uh, 
compensation related to restoration program, conservation program, uh, and high wetland uh, restoration. Then, uh, and so we need, of course, uh, to integrate the information that comes from different sources. Uh, now we have uh, a, a monitoring uh, um uh you can see in this slide the different uh, structure of uh, the monitoring system which has three components spatial biophysical and uh, information analysis and you can see the organizational chart uh, that uh, uh, explains uh, the administration model that uh, allows uh, for the operation of the uh, um, monitoring uh, system for forest and carbon, which include evaluating uh, units, processing unit, and reporting due to all this in the framework of a management model. The general goal is to monitor the condition of the forest uh, national assets uh, to guarantee protection, conservation, uh, and sustainable management uh, with specific uh, objective related to generating information, uh, producing information and statistics that are reliable on the update uh, of the national uh, forest management system then also biodiversity etc what are the principle of the uh, forest monitoring uh, the prin principle that are in the regulation is that monitoring will be generated by the national environmental authority in line with the uh, international standards uh, the results of the monitoring must be shared at uh, uh, national level across all the institution the monitoring also will seek uh, ongoing improvement uh, it will require long-term effort uh, and be able to integrate uh, priority issues it will have a multi-purpose uh, approach uh, the provision of information uh, will uh, provide accessible tools uh, to guarantee the quality and transparency of data and in north and uh, uh, there will be intersectoral agreements uh, and other principles that will that may be established uh, among the technical consideration we have uh, mapping uh, trajectories uh, uh, in the scale one 100,000, a consistent representation of the land coverage and use of land, uh, processes of uh, quality assurance and control, protocol of evaluation uh, for the uh, accuracy of changes. Other uh, related uh, subject, uh, is that we have uh, among technical consideration we have uh, carbon reservoir five carbon reservoir uh, related with biomass above soil on the below the soil and then we need uh, a uh, protocol for the uh, evaluation of uncertainty and then uh, specific, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, factors. So we started from a definition of forest, uh, which is uh, uh, natural vegetal coverage, at least one actor that includes the tre trees, and that complies with the definition of boss, and that include fruit, fruit, uh, palm crops, uh, pastures, and uh, uh, trees of parks and gardens. And uh, gross deforestation is uh, defined as anthropic uh, 
conversion of forest in other coverage and use of land. So the term excludes the zone of forest plantation, and so it's only uh, measured vis-a-vis -vis the native forest. And when, of course, we want a sustainable production and a, a, a production that is sustainable and free from deforestation, which allows to obtain uh, food in a stable form. In terms of the work between 2014 and 2021, well, I'll talk about uh, how the monitoring system has been uh, strengthened. The tools that we use are related to the CEPAL platform, uh, uh, open forest uh, tool developed by FAO. We generate the data and we have statistical uh, um, software. Uh, so we have the, to establish uh, uh, processing chains. Um, forgive me that uh, there is some uh, background noises uh, receiving uh, that come from the street. Uh, and so we uh, we continue with the uh, chain of uh, image uh, pro processing, the use of algorithm, uh, applying uh, principle of digital detection, and the we are as moving forward with the implementation of this uh, new reference level. And, and it has been a challenge in terms of keeping the consistencies be between the information we had before and the one we gather now. This includes, of course, uh, pre-processes analysis, uh, um, satellite image, uh, also ch changes. Another aspect uh, that we started strengthening uh, and is also part of the uh, challenge is the uh, identification of degradation in, in the Ecuador Amazon. There was a first uh, pilot uh, project that allowed us to find uh, tools uh, to identify the challenge we face to measure degradation. Uh, 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 because of the uh, mountain range uh, is uh, something degradation cannot be identified only with satellite images, which is something I imagine happens also in Colombia. And now in terms of early warnings, early warnings is also part of the uh, follow up that seeks not to provide uh, measurement, uh, but yes, identifying areas uh, where changes uh, are taking uh, place uh, uh, and not uh, a, a, a immediately because we don't have satellite images, but uh, yes, uh, an early warning system uh, uh, that allows for reporting every 15 days. And these are several things that we are implementing uh, uh, with semi-automized processes. Uh, uh, of course, this is, is uh, uh, one of the challenges is the uh, high level of uh, uh, cloud. I am going to uh, quickly move uh, uh, forward because I think my time is coming to an end. And we are in the second cycle of the National Forest Evaluation. Uh, more than 80 conglomerates uh, of, in the Amazon and with the support of the uh, German and Norwegian cooperation, uh, we hope to face our challenges, which are the use of satellite information, in this case, the national monitoring system. How can we face the challenge of permanent cloud uh, uh, over the uh, territory? And uh, that uh, can be uh, accomplished uh, 
by using input that will allow us to have transparent and sustainable reports. So that is the main challenge. Use this new available information and strengthen capacity at institution, uh, uh, at Ecuador institution level that will contribute to the uh, monitoring system. And also another challenge is that this information must be coherent with other uh, uh, reports, because as I said before, we have different reference level reports, uh, at national and international levels uh, related to specific uh, certification that we are applying for. And, uh, and we need to adjust to standard and requirements uh, proposed by different climate funding mechanisms. So, so it's not just monitoring deforestation, but also uh, measuring degradation and uh, following uh, uh, proper uh, forest management Uh, like the inclusion of transition criteria and uh, how environment uh, uh, has to be dealt with uh, for a proper and sustainable development. Of course, this implies uh, our, our work and other of the other institution. Here, uh, pictures of the national system team for forest monitoring and here uh, as initial additional data in for the national uh, information system on forest management uh, on forest monitoring uh, can be found on the website that you see on the slide basically this is what i wanted to tell you and thank you very much for the time you have uh, given me forgive me for spending uh, additional mo minutes then they want the, the the original minister they were allowed to meet imani thank you very much for your time and your uh, for all the things you have shared with us are very important and useful for the thing the people who are following us and surely to compare your information with what is happening here of course technology is a key we can develop uh, 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 early warning and allows us to monitor the compliance uh, with the agreement. We will talk about this in the next panel. We have two experts. One of them uh, is someone we already met uh, in the uh, previous panel, uh, uh, that is Ederson Cabrera, to, to talk about uh, satellite image for the uh, forest monitoring. Ederson Cabrera, uh, forest engineer, he is also leader of the Vision Amazonia program. And uh, he is again with us in this panel. Uh, Ederson, welcome again. Once again, Ederson, thank you. Hi, and, and good, Angie, good morning. It's good to be with you back again. Thank you, Ederson. And also we have uh, Gustavo Adolfo Galindo, uh, specialized in detection and, and PDI and for the uh, forest uh, Gustavo, welcome and good morning. Andy, buenos días. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Andy, good morning. Andy, good morning and thank you for the invitation. Now you have the floor. Uh, go ahead. You have the floor. Uh, yeah, can you tell us when you, the, yeah, we already seen the presentation. Okay, perfect. Okay, so Gustavo, I think uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Angie. We want to focus uh, on having a national analysis uh, and a follow up uh, at, uh, uh, we want to move from a global uh, uh, overall uh, monitoring system to a more local uh, specific uh, 
uh, uh, area related uh, monitoring and how we can achieve that through satellite images. First of all, we want to highlight that Colombia still is a forest uh, country uh, ar around uh, the municipality of all these municipalities of the country. There is at least one hectare of native uh, natural forest. Uh, uh, which represent the 59.8 million hectares across the territory, which is uh, more or less half of the territory. We it could be more if we are looking also at the planted uh, forest and other areas. Uh, and so we would actually reach more than 70% of the natural territory. Now, looking at the international context, uh, uh, forest in Colombia represent 1.5% of the global forest. In this 1.5, we find also a large diversity in biological groups, but also at the same um, at the same time, we have seen deforestation dynamics that were very high in the 90s, and it has been decreasing gradually, but it continues to be quite high with uh, co uh, comparison with the dynamics of uh, a reduction that uh, can be seen in other parts of the world. This is really why we need to uh, focus more on this. Uh, um, forests are crucial to follow up on the compliance with the Paris Agreement. And, um, and uh, um, also uh, changing uh, changing forest to other types of uh, uh, areas like grasslands for example and uh, all activities linked to the monitoring are uh, um, key to reach this uh, uh, goal by the year 2030 and so next slide this work focuses especially on producing information, information that can that is linked to the history of forests in the country. Now, the question is how to link this information to initiatives related to conservation and learning. Well, we need to be constantly making connections uh, between technologies, measurements, history, and actions. Next slide, please. So in order to achieve this, we need to undertake a number of actions in our fight against deforestation. The Amazonia framework and uh, different uh, national government initiatives are linked to three main pillars. One is legality, or the rule of law. One uh, has to do with CONALDEV and uh, to break down illegal structures, like illegal cropping and mining and the like. We need to constantly remove the sources of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and replace them for with, with restoration efforts. Another pillar is social and economic entrepreneurship, where we seek the uh, land ownership uh, conditions that are appropriate for social and economic uh, development, as well as um, sustainable productive activities and that opportunities that are, are available to all. We also need to constantly monitor, monitor and monitor. For this, we need a robust monitoring system so that we can follow up on sustainable productive activities and production activities and to ensure that land ownership and production setup is, is proper. That's why we need an appropriate monitoring system. That is how the EDAM has uh, built 
processing chains to use satellite imagery in forest monitoring. In this effort, we're using all kinds of satellite imagery, Landsat 7 and 8, which are, are basically our fighting horse, as well as other tools like Copernicus constellation, planet scope, uh, imagery, which are available for free, thanks to the support of the Norwegian partners. And we're also using other kinds of imagery. Thanks to this continuous work on research analysis and analysis of satellite imagery, we've built a number of technological innovations for forest monitoring initiatives in Colombia. All of these tools are available, can be downloaded uh, for free on the Kip KipCop uh, webpage, the GitHub pardon webpage, for which you can see the uh, URL here on the slide. This is for cloud masking to build different mosaics using different spatial stats and heat spot analysis of the impacted areas. Also based on NASA information. And we have also built different processing supply chains for early warning system. Many of these of, of, of these are built on Python and other systems, but those built on Python have allowed for the acceleration of many of the processes. And these are run both by uh, IDEAM on its servers as well as on the cloud. We've also built channels or chains to uh, to analyze these uh, these chains with th -E for addition, PCA4C, D for processing, and Akatama for quality control. Akatama alone has been uh, downloaded almost 70,000 times worldwide. Over the last year, it has been one of the most downloaded applications and it has provided a great deal of use, not just in Colombia, but in many places across the world where satellite imagery is used for climate change monitoring and overview. So these, these are this, the tools that are being used, not just for forest monitoring in Colombia, for us, we have a 30% density and at least five meters high. A number of exclusions, like where there are forest plantations and uh, palm crops. Those are not included in our definition of forests in the country. Again, these are the three definitions. You can see the color code in the bottom illustration and the top grid where the checks, uh, the check marks are included of what we are including and counting as forest cover. So again, this is what we follow up on at all levels, in all scales. to build our different methodologies and for the different reports that we present. In this case, the period of time is annually. 
but we also present reports on a quarterly basis and weekly basis. Now, the processing chain uses all of these uh, links that we're showing here, whereby imagery is downloaded, then there is masking based on clouds and shadows. Then we do what we call radiometric normalization based on Python processing through canonic analysis, canonical analysis to compare the different images against a base of all historical imagery taken since 2006 into that to 2020 and then we have different uh, annual measurements like the median the last valid pixel max min julian day etc each one of these annual measurements serves a specific purpose for a specific set of needs so that's where we analyze what has to do with forest degradation but also some measurements help us follow up on deforestation more than degradation and to identify certain changes. Some tools are very useful for quality control purposes, like the max and min measurements, as, as well as the Julian day measurements. And then variation, variation measurements, which are useful for other purposes. But based on this sets, we try to run appropriate quality control in processing all of this information so that we can use the information in all the processes that ensue after this data capture. One of them has to do with uh, detecting changes in forests where we analyze the main components implemented in key G QGIs, after which we go on to quite an interactive process. The process is almost automatic at this point, although here on the left uh, column, the green column, there is a certain level of uh, editing. After this editing, the process is much more interactive. We do visual verification and uh, results verification. And we also run quality control on a theme basis so that we can generate an annual a map for annual changes in each one of the processes. And we also present the level of uncertainty linked to these maps. These are the processes that we work on at all levels. Although to monitor uh, our conservation agreements at the local level, we need to run a number of adjustments on the process I have just described. But in general terms, this is what we're doing in each one of the phases. As a result, we are able to produce a number of reports. And in essence, this is how we're working to have uh, reports that have low levels of uncertainty at the both national, regional, local, and vereda levels, and also at the land ownership level, so that we can have better quality control. For this, we need to use uh, visual inputs more and local information more so that we can have area estimations with the lowest possible level of uncertainty at this level. For this, we need more detailed inputs, but also the methodology that will allow us to follow up on a per land ownership basis. So all of these tools are the tools that we are using in different ways, depending on the needs. Now, what I'm showing is just the methodology. With this, I yield to Ederson, who will talk more about the specific process that we run in order to have the uh, property or a state level measurement. 
Thank you so much. Ederson, you have the floor. Hello, this is Ederson speaking. Now, based on the technology that Gustavo has just explained, we are able to produce information on what is happening to our natural force in the country. One of the main pieces of information that we're able to produce the modern system is this, which is the trend for these natural forests. This is information up to 2019 where 47 percent of our forests were in uh, indigenous reservation areas 5.5 in uh, territories belonging to black communities 0 0.5 percent to campesino reservations 20.7 percent in the protected areas or basically national natural parks according to the CNAP system. And about 16% of our natural forests are in what we call forest reservation areas as declared by a law back in 1959, which have been zoned uh, for specific forest use according to the Ministry of the Environment. So as we see it in the earlier panel, forest areas in the country, so to speak, are not empty. Uh, they are they are occupied in the sense that people live there and use them. And that is why they need to be preserved to ensure that the conditions uh, stay in place for these communities. Now, the information that Gustavo has shown you um, is presented here as a statistic in terms of how deforestation is behaving even at a weekly level. This is information taken over about two years and a quarter, where each week is considered um, a, 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 an, an event in the deforestation uh, process. Now, the, analyzing this information has allowed us to find a very clear linkage between um, forest loss and, uh, and times of drought. Basically, during the first quarter of the year and the last quarter of the year, which is when we have dry seasons for the most part in uh, Colombia at large. This is somewhere between the end of October, beginning of November, into the end of December, and then with a very uh, high drought peak in, in January, and the dry season coming to an end towards the end of March. However, each territory has a different behavior in that regard regarding the uh, dry season. But we also see higher deforestation during the third quarter in the year in specific regions like Magdalena Medio or the Amazon, linked to dry season and therefore a loss of natural forests. So that's why we need to look at the national context and the regional context. What you're seeing here is that we are detecting at an early stage uh, peaks in deforestation levels. But this is also thanks to local monitoring initiatives. Now, this is a close to the Serrania Natural Park in uh, the Caguan region in the north east. The yellow, the orange, and the red show how on a monthly basis um, 
deforestation is uh, is behaving and we see that this is towards the end of 2020. The red and the orange show deforestation in January and February this year, whereas yellow is towards the dry season uh, during the end of 2020. So what we see here, uh, this uh, also allows to produce a consolidated number at a regional level and then country level. And we can produce, again, this information, not just at the regional level, but also at the municipality level and even the vereda or on a per rural area uh, basis. Now, we think that this method can be used too to follow up on forest conservation agreements that are attained locally. In other words, countries, uh, pardon, communities that live in uh, forest reservations and that have a commitment with uh, environmental authorities to conserve, to preserve these forests. Because we don't want the type of scenario that we're seeing in the top right corner image where extensive uh, areas of land are being lost. These are the ones that make about 34% of deforestation in the country. Pots of land greater than 50 hectares of, of, of loss. So these local conservation agreements are still what we need to um, further the work on with local communities and local authorities and environmental authorities that may allow for those uh, incentives that will promote the preservation of forest areas. This is something we talked about during the panel too, where the country is developing initiatives like forest development nuclei. In the Amazon map, this is the Amazon biome, which is our main rainforest. We have the Caquita and Guaviare departments and with local communities there, which include almost 1,000 campesino families in, living in the Cartagena del Chaira, Solano, and one other municipality, they're working in preserving natural forests so that they can, they can um, extract resources from the forest, the living forest, and not have to sell the forest to extract resources. Like for example, in the Molinos del Caguan urban area, they are working with the communities there and we'll see the program that they're working on more specifically. Uh, but basically the program uh, establishes a number of preservation agreements in the different ranches or estates where campesino families get an economic incentive, a financial incentive, so that they stop uh, historical deforestation processes. Same goes, for example, in Orotulla, a rural area that uh, um, is traditionally uh, a gold extraction area. These uh, incentives are being provided there too. Same in Guaviare, for example, here in the Chiribiquete National Park, which is what I'm pointing, right in the heart of the Amazon. Where the uh, communities are benefited, and, and that benefit is also taken to other communities that have signed these conservation agreement. We have identified uh, the kind of uh, forest management that exists uh, in the uh, Colombian Amazon. And we see that more and more community 
are beca are becoming the beneficiaries of these uh, agreement and more and more communities are willing to sign these agreement uh, on conservation so that uh, we can have a sustainable forest uh, on a mid and long term basis uh, the effect uh, that you uh, these uh, colors that you will concede like the uh, uh, the yellow orange affects area of natural uh, forest in putumayo guaviare and vichada mainly and that of course uh, shows an impact in places like vaupes guania in amazonas these uh, forest conservation agreement are uh, to the benefit of uh, sustainable uh, forest management uh, areas that the uh, communities uh, comply uh, with uh, uh, keeping so that the communities uh, can uh, be sure that, that their areas is really being monitored and followed up let's look at two examples one in gaviare and another one in the forest nucleus uh, of for, uh, Lucion, and we'll see what the uh, forest conservation agreement is about. Uh, this is the case of Los Puertos, 22 uh, communities uh, initially benefited, then ex extended to others. The agreement of con conservation were signed in November 2019, and the monitoring system since December 2019 uh, uh, monitors whether the conservation agreement is complied with or not. In other words, whether there is deforestation or not. Uh, we, uh, we work here with the regional, uh, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the uh, sustainable development uh, uh, organization in this area, but together with them, we work and we have identified that in this area coverage is 92 percent of the conservation agreement this means that iq sensitivity in black these are the border of the plots that have signed the conservation agreement and so uh, th this shows how these lots are uh, keeping the forest and and you can see how no forestation take place in all the, and and this of course it's important because these area border with the indian reservation uh, 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 that you can see below so and in other parts you can see deforestation area so together with the environmental local authority we work with the community to revert the process of deforestation to show the community that we are indeed monitoring the agreement that they have signed and so we have been monitoring month by month since december 2019 in these areas and we can see that uh, deforestation has uh, decreased and as we as we can see the majority of the areas uh, are in areas uh, where the, the majority of deforestation takes place in areas that uh, in areas where the deforestation uh, the the uh, conservation agreement has not been signed the same situation can be analyzed in Caqueta, where compliance is 88% of the conservation agreement. 93 agreements were signed with uh, uh, Campesinos community. And, and you can see here that we have identified that the high, there's a high compliance level but when there isn't then we can work with communities and families to make sure that agreements are complied with and they commit themselves in restoring and recovering the area with natural forest we the satellite the light the satellite images that norway uh, provides to all citizens can also be used by the community and by the expert and by IDEAM 
to monitor whether the conservation agreements are complied with or not and incentives uh, uh, paid to those who sign the agreement are a tool to promote the signing of the agreement and the monitoring as a tool to make sure that the agreement are complied with. So we work with communities through incentives to achieve the conservation of natural forest conservation. We This, this is why uh, we rigor rigorously monitor the activity and uh, we try to have better satellite image so that we can cert certify that what is boss uh, with what is forest covered is precisely kept and finally the, this is where is the uh, information available well we have uh, tried to design uh, different tools uh, to provide the information we generate uh, we always uh, of course uh, are um, ready to receive a whatsapp message or an email from local communities if the communities uh, uh, do not have access to these uh, platform and want to receive uh, the information from us. This is an overall uh, uh, presentation and uh, overview of uh, how we identify conservation areas and where we can uh, uh, keep in touch with the uh, local community. Thank you, Ederson. We have several questions. Uh, Juan Carlos uh, asked, is it feasible uh, to have training on the methodology, uh, open data that allow for local government and uh, community to replicate this methodology? Of course, of course, we have a training program on an ongoing basis in the monitoring system that can be used by both uh, national, regional, and local uh, institutions in the framework of the uh, community participation initiatives. We uh, provide exchange of experiences between uh, uh, communities that already have been trained and those who would like to be trained. So I think that we can uh, uh, surely uh, give information to the uh, to the people who are interested in this kind of training in order to provide opportunity to uh, strengthen and build existing capacity. The information is more and more available in a global planet, and so we need uh, to have uh, uh, available tools, and these tools must be available to everyone. Uh, a question to Gustavo. Christian asked, uh, does the, is the impact on the, uh, is partially on the part of the property, land property, or on the, well, the follow-up can be done both on uh, a part of the property or the whole property. The compliance with the agreement depends on what has been established. Any change within an actors can be identified, and one can also identify the, in what part of the property the deforestation is taking place and whether the agreement is being complied or not. Not necessarily the area established in the agreement is the same area of the total property. Okay, thank you very much. We have several questions, and unfortunately, because of time reason, we cannot ask them all, but we hope they will be uh, answered through the chat or through email. Uh, thank you to uh, Ederson and Gustavo. 
since when do you have data and how much they are useful for uh, conservation in the case of the amazon forest uh, incentive uh, of conservation agreement have been signed uh, uh, since november 2016 so we have uh, a database of the protest the pro pro properties uh, uh, that have been benefited however data are also available from before and so for certain uh, uh, nucleus uh, we are um, keeping the information since before this is important because it allows us to see what has happened and we can identify areas where the conservation has been promoted different from areas where we need to strengthen our monitoring and our message to promote uh, uh, the reduction of the deforest deforestation so that so uh, also uh, in terms of official data data not with high resolution images but uh, uh, low resolution data we have a database of 20 years so we can go back to the beginning of this century we have data since the year of 2000 that allows us to develop the and and, and build the overall uh, um, uh, history thank you ederson and gustavo it was really a very interesting uh, presentation for all of us and now to move on as uh, it's important to uh, keep uh, forests and i'd like to show you a video where a, a couple of peasants uh, show uh, uh, that this is possible san vicente del caguan we are uh, we are campus you know and we used to live in a place uh, where we had the 400 uh, hectares uh, that we and we started deforesting them to uh, for to plant uh, coca plant we 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 worked a lot and and then um, uh, we we were uh, uh, subject to uh, uh, air spraying, so we sort of lost uh, the coca plantation. And, uh, and so after being people involved in deforestation, we decided to become uh, people who do the opposite. And we decided uh, to plant uh, cocoa. Uh, and, and, and now we have 15 hectares only. So uh, be, after having 400 hectares, uh, we were happy and we only 15 and contributing to forestation we are um, involved in the and committed with uh, um, the conservation of uh, uh, eight hectares this is a commitment for us and our family and now we live in these 15 hectares of land where and people tell her, are you crazy planting uh, cocoa in, in this land that's not going to give you money but that's not true uh, we have uh, received the seeds and we are using them and and, and really uh, we know that we cannot uh, uh, cut uh, uh, or destroy the land because this is uh, what will be uh, useful for us and that will give uh, 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 give us wealth in the future our future is to save uh, the uh, environment uh, and our uh, goal is to uh, preserve and conserve the land that has been uh, given us we uh, keep our hopes high
Bueno, y qué bonito video. Esta pareja de campesinos. Uh, very beautiful video. This uh, couple of campesinos shows us that it's possible to move away from illegal crops and move to legal crops, something that we admire and we uh, encourage everyone to uh, the uh, care of our forest. Citizens are essential in uh, processes of conservation. The next uh, panel will allow to inform us about a community that uh, protects uh, the Serrania of San, San Lucas. So I'd like to invite Hermes from uh, uh, Funko Promas and uh, Funko Promas uh, and Johnny Hernando, uh, the legal representative of Funko Promas. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Hermes John. Th good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation by IDEAM. Thank you and a special greeting from this uh, part of Colombia where we uh, are. Uh, good afternoon uh, to each one of you. We are very thankful for this uh, important invitation. And uh, and uh, we are been working on the monitoring and conservation of the forest. Okay, thank you very much for your time and for uh, being with us. We want to show you a video uh, which is uh, that shows uh, how we have wanted to work with the children. Uh, the monitoring activities have uh, made us uh, come closer to children and elderly. And uh, we see that the, uh, we do not see anymore the forest as wood only that can produce uh, wealth. So uh, our views on for it uh, has changed uh, uh, our way of behaving and we are conveying this to uh, elderly and young children. And this video shows somehow what I, I am talking about. We have organized a simple monitoring exercise that we believe uh, uh, will protect the environment on, along the Walker River and other water uh, uh, bases. We want to say to Colombia in the world that in order to engage in community monitoring, we must fall in love with this and we must convey this love to the children. Children will now today show you how along three, four meters, our children can find plastic waste, uh, uh, bottles. This is also one way of monitoring because of course all these uh, um, uh, all these uh, waste affects and has an impact uh, on uh, the environment of this uh, area. We also find uh, uh, that uh, we, we also find that uh, um, deforestation issues are simply uh, which support uh, the uh, um, the uh, municipality's uh, office uh, is uh, launching a campaign also with peasant uh, organization in order to monitor uh, the and uh, so that our species that are endemic and which are many can be preserved. We want to encourage you to protect uh, the forest, uh, falling in love with the uh, uh, forest, with the water. And if we learn uh, to uh, monitor, if we all involve ourselves uh, as peasants, as a community, involving our children, uh, uh, we can understand that conservation depends on good monitoring activity, and this will uh, 
teach us how to save uh, the environmental uh, the environment of our community on behalf of the municipality we have established uh, a program that uh, preserves the biodiversity of our area and and the natural resources also uh, highlighting the importance of our uh, endemic species we need to reduce uh, climate change impact uh, that activities like uh, traditional mining extensive cattle raising deforestation is uh, uh, generating on our municipality this uh, allows to conserve uh, the uh in uh, species in dangers that we have here we as young people must uh, uh, own this process it is said to see that we lose more and more love for nature and the, and that uh, we uh, the abundance of flora and fauna and fauna reminds only the uh, history of our past so we need to start ourselves uh, monitoring and taking care of our environment and making a uh, an important and dramatic change in the way we live because the future of our generation and future generation depends only on us so if we don't do something now it will be irreversible um, in the last uh, 50 years uh, there's been uh, changes of the climate there are years uh, where there have too much rain or uh, years when it's too hot uh, before uh, climate was uh, more stable we knew that the rainy season would start uh, in april now it's the opposite uh, maybe uh, before uh, uh, the climate were uh, more uh, predictable uh, and now things have changed and it's impossible to foresee what uh, this uh, 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 where are you from uh, well we we are from these uh, nearby villages uh well i can see that you are enthu enthusiastic about this uh, 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 area where we can see uh, uh see water and, and and these places are called by us uh, sacred places holy places uh, places that cannot be touched and sometimes we find that places where the water uh, uh is uh, present as a spring then uh, deforestation uh, uh, or la lack of care uh, sort of affects the area what have you found here what have you found well fish have you seen fishes yes well if there are fish it means that the water is clean and that also tells us that there is an ecosystem which is uh, healthy uh what could you tell uh, the children about these uh, uh, water uh, spring uh, uh, how how ca uh, we can see how a little uh, volume of water this little volume of water is something that then becomes a river uh, 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 further along the way well, water is important only for uh, uh, the air. We, uh, the trees, uh, apart from providing uh, a healthy uh, environment uh, for the water, it also helps us purifying the air. Now, from the artistic point of view, uh, from uh, uh, crafts uh, and art, uh, how can uh, we can uh, tell the children uh, to monitor the health of the forest uh, well in our artistic activities uh, uh, harmony 
is always a topic uh, and we work also on landscape uh, uh, and so the important thing is that they can see the colors of the landscape and the fact that we can paint landscape and uh, to the extent that we maintain and preserve the landscape then we can have uh, the possibility to paint uh, uh, landscape uh, this natural environment uh, allows us to uh, become aware uh, we we see also what plastic bags uh, bottles glass uh, the children have realized that uh, they have seen this and so the idea is that if we come here we can contribute this is what uh, monitoring is about monitoring is about identifying uh, the damages and so we find uh, bottles plastic bags and uh, and so we can decide how to remedy this and so i imagine that uh, uh, you we can say that the monitoring is uh, one way of monitoring is is helping uh, protecting this is why the municipal uh, uh, institutions are launching this campaign encouraging people to come and know this place uh, 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 so that you can visit them and uh, contribute uh, to um, contribute to to uh, protect these areas which must be uh, uh, protected so that future generation will benefit from this protection Very well, children. So we're going to be monitoring what is impacting the forests. Let's look at what we find in terms of litter or others. And that way, we will be monitoring, understanding what is impacting the trains, the trees, pardon, and water sources. So let's please grab the bag. What did you find here? Let's collect everything that is not part of this landscape, that is not natural to this area. Look at that. What else have you found here? Plastic bottles. Look at that. Watch out for any insects or animals, okay? Here we are, collecting debris, litter. This is where we are understanding what litters this beautiful place trash, waste. What do you have there? So look at what we found in our monitoring effort. In just five square meters, we found these many plastic bags that are ruining our forests and water sources. This is all the litter we found in this quick monitoring exercise. So this is an example of harm to the environment, harm to our forests. This indeed was a monitoring exercise. 
Someone here was asking about the fish. Fish eat this and then they die. Without this plastic litter, we would have more life in the water. But we need to be more aware of how we need to protect our forests. From the mayor's office, we are highly committed with um, art in the process of preserving our forests. And how is the art school is going to do an artistic project through an endeavor called Art on Earth. So children here are collecting things that are typical of this area, natural logs, pieces of, of leaves. So beyond being um, artists and learning how to paint and draw, the idea of our art classes is to raise awareness and love for the environment. And that's what the mayor's office wants us to focus on too in our art courses. So yes, we are working on different artistic expressions, but based on elements found in nature. So how do these exercises contribute to conservation and preservation and to monitoring of our water sources and our forests? How can we, through this artistic expression, carry our message and communicate it outwards so that we can show to the rest of the world what is happening in these territories and what community monitoring can do what it can contribute. Indeed, as I was saying, everything we do at the art school is uh, comprehensive in nature. And both in groups and individually, children constantly partake in this type of effort that uh, moves them and um, encourages them to preserve the environment. Through these activities, the children will learn what impacts the environment negatively. And surely with these activities, they will be more aware and they will in turn make their parents and their families more aware of how important it is to take care of the environment. So this is this goes beyond the classroom, beyond a traditional teaching uh, format where children are experimenting and living through nature and they're learning a great deal and they're becoming promoters of the environment in their communities. So if I'm understanding correctly, teacher, we need to fall in love with the forest. We need to fall in love with the water. And we need to know that based on that, on this love, we can be protectors of our environment. When I monitor firsthand, I learn what the problems are. I see what impacts the environment. So what I'm seeing is that if we empower our children, if we empower this type of initiative that you lead, we will be better at preserving our forests. We see that the children in your class are highly committed to protecting the environment. So with this, I want to thank you. I want to thank your class for letting us join you in this monitoring effort so that we can all see how this then can be taken to a more technical level meaning we will later know measurements and the like, but first we need to fall in love. Monitoring the forest is very important because it allows for fish to continue living. It allows for more oxygen to be in the present in the air. It helps us. It helps us not get sick. It helps us in many, many ways. And we are working with our hands here. We're working with uh, different crafts here and we're helping preserve the environment. So 
So what I tried to represent here was Mother Earth. I took leaves, some small branches. What did you do here, Luz? What did you do here? What's your artwork here? This is like a, a home, a home made of sticks, natural sticks. Is that your home? Indeed. It's a beautiful home. Thank you, Luz. And Sebas, what do you have? I also built a house. Also, we're seeing pyramids built by our children with rocks. And over there? Look at that. There are a number of things to point out here. How Mother Nature is providing the necessary materials for us to build our homes. We're finding wood, we're finding rocks, and we need not impact the environment. Look at how Mother Earth gives us what we need and how little girl who is representing Mother Earth with leaves is showing us how we're surrounded by beautiful things. Thank you so much for what you have taught us this morning. My name is Johnny Arnaldo Fandiño Chanaga. I'm the executive director of the Community Environmental Protection Association in the Serrania. And we are in Santa Rosa de Bolivar. Our reservation collects 7,500 protected hectares and more than 700 families that live and and uh, find our livelihoods in this area. But some others don't want us to do what we do in this area regarding monitoring and conservation of our species and our forests and our water sources. We are at 1,800 meters above sea level, the second highest peak in the mountain range or Serrania. And along with IDEAM, we are working on collecting information since they had all information collection initiatives across the country. An image is worth a thousand words. And that's why we wanted to show you this video, how working with the future, which are our children, how we are encouraging them to stop environmental depletion, to stop deforestation, to stop this disaster. We also participate in public policy making through the mayor's office. We have cleaning efforts, everything related to preserving the environment. This is Angie speaking. Johnny and uh, Hermes, thank you so much for sharing this video. It's very exciting to see little children committed to the environment. We're running almost out of time, so we have to rush. We have a number of questions for you. Mr. Hermes, what is the importance of uh, having future generations understand the forest and the need for cons conserving the forest? Well, the importance is, is paramount. When we involve children, they become interested and then they ask us and they they, they want us to protect the forest and they speak from the heart. And this is very, very important. So if adults don't listen to our children, there's no future for any of us. It's important to involve children so that children can see firsthand why these places are sacred and that they can become natural protectors of these areas. And just speaking, thank you, Hermes. Second and last question. Why is environmental education important to promote forest conservation and preservation? Edmund speaking. Uh, well, 
thanks to our work with EAM, to the different panels and talks that we've been invited to, we've been able to relay how important it is to preserve the forest. The forests mean many things, not just wood, not just the oak. They mean many, many things. And once we understand that, everything starts to flow. And we understand why we need to support and monitor. Monitoring is very important. The importance of monitoring has made us aware of how important the force is when we see different impacts, different uh, negative effects, we see how important monitoring is. So thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. And we hope to have you here uh, soon someday so that you get to know the Serranía de San Lucas firsthand. And you speaking. Hermes and Joni, thank you so much for your remarks. It's a wonderful way to wrap up the first day of the fifth annual meeting for the monitoring system. With that, we ask that you join us tomorrow for the second day of this fifth annual meeting. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about the National Forest Inventory. Thank you so much for joining us and goodbye.